Good evening and welcome to this meeting of the Board of Selectmen for Tuesday, March, not March 19th, 2019. Prior to the meeting, the Board met in executive session to discuss litigation strategy with respect to Wall Street development, petition of Eversource Energy for a zoning exemption, and to consider strategy with respect to pending litigation, Booth versus Town of Hopkinton, Higgins versus Town of Hopkinton, and Moran versus Town of Hopkinton. Uh, because the Chair declares that discussion in open session will be detrimental to the litigating position of the Board. So now we will enter into our open session. And um, if we have our scouts here, we traditionally like to have them come and help uh, lead the Pledge of Allegiance. Austin and Jordan, are you here? Will you come up and lead the pledge for us, please? Isn't that great? And we will begin with our public forum. Residents are invited to share their ideas, opinions, and questions regarding town government. Is there anyone here tonight who'd like to address the board? Please, Madam Mr. Chair, Regan. while Joe's making his way, mm -hmm. um, I, have to, I have a hard stop at 9 o'clock. I have okay. a family thing i got to get, get some kids out of. So. All right, well, we'll do the best. Okay. Mr. Regan. Yes, ma'am. see you. Very quickly, I just want to confirm a rumor that Mr. Catino said I really should come up and confirm, and that we do have an article in the warrant to purchase a bucket truck. Correct? Mm -hmm. It's there. We do. You know what I want to say? Thank you very much. It took me four trips, but thank you very much. <laughs> Finally found a chink in the armor in some of them, and I was able to wish my way in there. Exactly. That's great. You know what, guys and girls? It's a start. We need to do it. A year ago, just about this week, I think, the roads were impassable, as you well know. And those of us who were out actually working in it, it was really bad, trying to keep the roads open. So if that's on the, uh, the, uh, on the warrant, I appreciate it, and I will definitely get up to town meeting to support it. And I wish to thank all of you for, and, and we are advertising for Tree Warden, correct? That's great, too. So hang on one sec. Madam Chair, do we have an article on the warrant, or do we have a line item in the budget? Or whatever. There's an article, I believe. Yeah. Is it an article? It's on the it's on, warrant. It's on the warrant. Okay. I'm not quite sure which it is. In what manner is it on the warrant? Everything on the warrant is an article. I'm sorry? Everything on the warrant is an article. It's not a standalone article, I don't think. It's yeah, inclusive. It's, it's, <laughs> it's uh, a little going on here. <laughs> Letter I on article uh, on the pay as you go capital expenses. So it's contained within an article, Joe, with okay. some other stuff, right? Potato, sure. potato, as long as it's there. Right? As long as you're, as long as it's there. Okay, that's my sure. Good. I just want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you, Joe, okay, for bringing it up. Check it off your bucket list. Uh, yeah, really, huh? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> no pun intended. I'm just, oh, no Joe. pun intended. No, so. not at all. Okay, anybody else? I have a quick uh, something to, to say. Um, I went into the Fleet Center on Sunday to watch the Hopkins and Hillers boys hockey, high school hockey team play Wachusett. They came up a little short, but they had a great season. It's as far as any team from Hopkins has ever gotten. And um, much like trees and trash are in the hearts of all you guys, hockey is kind of my thing. Um, so congratulations to the, uh, to the Hillers for a, a season well played. I will add to that, and Mr. Katina was there as well. I understand they beat out about 75 other other teams to get to that spot. Most uh, importantly, one was Ashland. Yeah, they so. did an awesome job on the on Wednesday night at Songus, and uh, I even ran into our DPW director there. But then I found out he was there for Wachusett. But he was there for both. He, his his <laughs> alma mater was Wachusett, but he said he was there for Hopkinton. Madam Chair, do you think that we could put um, 
the hockey team on the agenda maybe for our next meeting? If they'd like to come. I mean, they don't always want to go to the White House, but they might come see us. <laughs> I'd still like to build a wall and have Ashland any, pay for it. Any other public <laughs> comments? We're getting punchy and it's only seven, six, four to five. Okay. So, uh, next is our consent agenda. And on the consent agenda are the following <coughs> items. Uh, board minutes, the Board of Selectmen will consider approving the three of uh, the May, uh, March 5th, 2019 Board of Selectmen minutes, two, library fund gift. The Board of Selectmen will consider accepting an $18 gift from Dale Cohen of New Britain, Connecticut to the Hoppington Library Fund for, her, for the Inez Globman Fund. Three, ambulance fund gifts. The Board of Selectmen will consider accepting two gifts to the ambulance fund. A, $50 gift from Joan Antonio in memory of Mary Palmer Hayward and a $200 gift from Florence L. Tower in memory of Kathleen M. Gross. Mm -hmm. The Board of Selectmen will consider accepting donation gifts from the Boston Athletic Association as per the marathon policy to the town of Hoppington and to the school department in the amount of $124,500 and $25,000 respectively. Five, smock appointment. The Board of Selectmen will consider recommending the reappointment of Joseph Morrissey of Hopkinton as Hopkinton's public representative to the South Middlesex Opportunity Council, SMOC, with a term length determined by the board, but not less than three years. Mr. Morrissey has been a representative on SMOC since 2015, and SMOC is seeking the recommendation of the Board of Selectmen as the governing authority to make the recommendation as requested. And number six, 2019 Boston Marathon Training Run. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving the use of local roads for a training run <coughs> in advance of the 2019 Boston Marathon on March 23, 2019 from 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. The request includes blocking and or obstructing some local roads, temporary no parking areas, 10 Porta Johns on Marathon Way, and temporary signage. Would anyone like to speak directly to one of these items oh uh, number three please number three the ambulance fund gifts I just want to have one quick comment on number six the marathon training run okay then I will request a motion to approve item one board minutes item two library fund gifts item five smock appointment so moved uh, Is there a sec? What about, yeah, okay. One, two, five, yeah. One, two, three. So there is no four, right? Oh, no, oh, four gifts. I'm sorry. Those oh, other yeah. gifts, the, I'm sorry, the gifts from the BAA are on item number four. So one, two, four, and six? Yes. No, one, two, four, and five. We're, we're one, pulling one, two, four, out five. three. One, two, four, and five. And six. So, so moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, that's unanimous. Yeah. Uh, item three, ambulance fund gifts. Mr. Ted Stone. Yep, so again, uh, it seems like every week we're, we're thanking some, some people, uh, some townspeople and some out of townspeople for donating to this <coughs> great, uh, great ambulance fund. Um, this week it's, uh, you know, Kathy Gross, her, uh, her son is still on the fire department here in, in town. Her father, I mean, her husband, George, was a lieutenant for us for a long time. And um, Mary Palmer Hayward, um, her son <coughs> Joe uh, was one of my best friends. He's he's uh, he was on the fire department. He's actually the one who got me going there. Uh, her son David, uh, their father David Skip, uh, you know their uncle Skip. Uh, just a long lineage, and with the uh, with how the town's growing, a lot of the the uh, the stuff from the town, the long times town people are lost. And uh, I always want to take just a quick minute just to say thank you to, to the people from town, um, uh, noting some of these uh, exceptional Hopkins people that have passed to allow this ambulance fund to keep growing. So thank you to everyone. Excellent. Okay. And I had just comment on the training run. Is there anyone here representing that run? Uh, good evening. Just, just very quickly, I noticed in the police department's um, comments that they requested that the Porta Johns not go on Marathon Way, as you had indicated, but put them on Ash Street. Are you comfortable with that? 
yes, I believe that we ultimately put them on uh, Ash Street last year uh, as it was. So okay. uh, that's that's accurate. You're, you're <coughs> it was Marathon Way was what was specified, but you, you will be doing Ash Street. Yes. And you have a plan for some kind of cleanup of the site. Absolutely. Look forward to uh, being here uh, myself, and there will be uh, volunteers, probably some even in this room, that may be uh, helping out with that. So we look forward to leaving it better than we uh, found it. That's all I want to know. Sounds good. Thank, Thank you. you. If, if, if I may, sorry. Mr. Mr. Come on. Through the chair, may be helpful for us to publicly identify who's before the board. Mm. Oh. Um, you just say, say your name. Oh, oh, uh, Jack Fleming from the Boston Athletic Association. All right. Thank you. Jack. Thank you for having us. Thank you for welcoming the. And uh, you know, runners. while you're right here, I really should have pulled out the yeah, BAA's right. contribution. <laughs> we're just like rushing through to trying to keep the schedule, but you know, the amount of dollars we're looking at, 124,525,000, um, that's, just, that's just so appreciated. Uh, we couldn't do it without um, the community and the leadership here, so we are uh, ultra thankful to you, and we look forward to a fantastic next month. Thank you. I am remiss in not st addressing that specifically not because we are so grateful. It's a true partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fletcher. Thanks for coming. Madam Chair, so this, the gift is for the upcoming marathon, <coughs> correct? Correct. And all the costs. So, so this goes to pay. We're not getting 150 grand in cash. No. This goes to pay all the costs we're going to have, and then what's left over goes Becomes to the marathon, marathon fund. fund. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I will entertain a motion then to approve items. Three, the ambulance fund gifts, and item six, the Boston Marathon Training Run 2019. So, second. Uh, <laughs> You're all speak at once. Okay, moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, that is unanimous. And now, my favorite part of these meetings, we have proclamations. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving proclamations for Eagle Scouts <coughs> Jordan Hanna and Austin Marquis of Hockington Boys <coughs> Scout Troop 4. Jordan and Austin, will you come up, please? We have had quite a number of these in recent years, and it's not to say that this is commonplace or easy. It's more a testament, I think, to the quality of our two scout troops, Troop 4 and Troop 1, and to the quality of some of our young people, because to achieve the Eagle Scout Award, uh, I think it's only done by about 4% of the scouts who ever start out in scouting. And I can say that every lesson learned along the way in scouting is valuable and stays with the young men and women throughout their lives, but there's nothing that rivals attaining the highest award possible, which is the Eagle Scout. So welcome and congratulations. Um, I will also just say that Jordan and Austin will be at their <coughs> Eagle Scout Court of Honor on Sunday, March 31st at St. Michael's. Uh, parish in Southboro. The Board of Selectmen has been invited and if anyone can attend it is a wonderful experience and let me tell you it never gets old. So please, Jordan, why don't you start off and tell us about your Eagle Scout project. So my Eagle Scout project, I built a 20-foot bridge that is six feet wide and it is behind Ash Street, sort of behind Center School. Oh. Yeah. So it connects a series of trails back there over a river to prevent the degradation of the banks. So how would you access it? Down like with where the Upper Charles Trail is going to go? or um, You can access it from the farmhouse on Ash Street oh, or Elmer. up behind Center School. Okay. Excellent. And Austin. Um, for my Eagle Scout project, I went to Orchard Hill Retirement Center in Shrewsbury and I installed a large purple mountain birdhouse there on a pole and we hoisted it up there. And around that, we installed a lot of flower bushes and shrubs and a lot of other scenery for them. So it was nice. And Austin, tell us what else you have to do to become an Eagle Scout. Um, That's just the capstone. Yeah, That's it really is. Road. Um, other than the project, you have to get a certain amount of merit badges, um, abide by the scout oath and law in your everyday activities, and to participate in other like community service projects. 
so like other Eagle Scout projects you can help with. And, yeah. and, and Jordan, it sounds to me like the projects you two do, it's not like you do it yourself. These are, these are too much to do it yourself. What, what goes into one of these projects and what, what are the elements in a project that would qualify with your troop as an Eagle Scout project? So actually building the project is only one or two weekends, but the series of planning that the months of planning beforehand is really the majority of the work and you're leading your fellow scouts in that project. So that's, that's the real ch challenge is to organize it and fundraise for it and reach out to people to see if they can help you with it. That's, it's the connections to make it happen. And the stuff that doesn't go right along the way probably teaches you a lot too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have any of those? Uh, yeah. Um, just some minor mishaps along the way with the Eagle Scout project, like maybe people like misplace things, so like, oh, we can't find a shovel somewhere, so now we have to go find a shovel and come <laughs> back and then, you know, do that all in a like set time frame. Yeah. So. yeah. We had an issue with handheld drills not being powerful enough, so we had to get a generator and a quarter drill to... Oh, wow. Yeah. And then when digging into the ground at the retirement center, we accidentally struck a uh, sprinkler. Ooh. So uh, we Ooh. had to work around that, <clears throat> but it's all good now. Where does the money come from for these projects? Um, for my project, <clears throat> at least, it was all donated by the beneficiary, Orchard Hill itself. But usually that's not the case. Usually you go around and fundraise for the project. So for mine, I fundraised by um, going to the recycling center and collecting cans and then uh, depositing those for, and then I also had uh, some donations and uh, businesses donated materials. It's a lot of cans to fund a bridge. Yeah. Wow. Board members, questions, I, I, please. I was I know, waiting I for just, you to ask anybody else. I know, else. but I just, these Eagle Scouts are one of my favorite things, and I just can't help it. No, I'm um, actually picking up on, on uh, <laughs> Madam Chairman's uh, comments on, on needing help. Um, are there any local businesses or, or, or people that you'd like to give a shout out for? Because this is, you know, it, it, it's, it's important to, uh, <coughs> to know the businesses that really do help out. We, we have, a, we have a, as, as was mentioned before, we have a great uh, pair of troops in town and, and we really do produce a lot of Eagle Scouts. And there are, there are certain um, uh, businesses in town that, that really step up. So are there any that really came up and helped either of you? Um, Hopkinton and Ullenberg donate, um, donated a lot of the uh, hardware for the bridge. And um, the, the top of the bridge all came out of the old barn on Ash Street, so it's recycled wood. And um, Miss Moran, Jack Brennan's grandmother, she donated a, a large sum. So that was very helpful. And I'd like to thank um, the whole Orchard Hill organization. They all um, helped me through the process and helped fund everything, and they really knew what they wanted to do and helped me along the way. And I'd also like to thank my neighbor, Jen Belisi, who was <coughs> there. Um, she also like guided, she gave me the idea for the project herself, so she definitely knew a lot about it and was really glad in the end that it was built. So I'd like to thank her too. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to say congratulations. Um, it's a fabulous achievement. Mike, I've, I've been riding the, uh, the trails out, out by College Rock and up in Vietnam on my mountain bike, and I see your, these bridges all the time. Um, so one of, one of the questions that's always risen in my mind is like, do you guys go out and get plans for these? Are these pre-planned, or is this like the design something that you come up with as, uh, as a scout? So for my bridge, um, uh, along with that donation from Miss Moran, she requested that it was strong enough to um, have her horses ride across it. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a struggle to figure out. Yeah. Um, it ended up being a case of build it way stronger than it has to be, and then it'll be okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I had uh, Ben Cherko look over my plans for the bridge to make sure it was structurally sound. Wow, I think it's fabulous. I think the uh, 
it's, it's a wonderful life lesson to be able to contribute to your town and, and to work, uh, organize, put a whole project together. It's, uh, it's a valuable life experience, and I think it's going to serve you well as you both get older and, and move forward in life. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations. An Eagle Scout isn't anything anyone can ever take away from you. Um, I know that um, when I'm looking over resumes to hire people, I know that when, uh, you, know, when you see Eagle Scout on the, on the resume, it shows that they're, they're of a certain character, and it's definitely a character that you like to, uh, you know, you like to kind of exploit and, and hire, and so it's a, it's a great thing to, mm -hmm. to have on your resume. Congratulations. Uh, it seems like we have these guys come through all the time, so it's uh, it's, it's not not not, not to belittle that, but it just shows all the the, uh, the hard work that uh, that you guys are doing, and that the you know your your parents, all the all the support that your folks and your your families give you, and the and the leadership that your scout masters from Cub Scouts right on up through. So, uh, congratulations to both of you. Well done. What's cool is when you do interviews to to Mr. Ted Stone's point, and uh, I interview people all the time and. <laughs> interview college graduates, recent college graduates, and they'll have Eagle Scout on their resume or on the application in some fashion. Uh, and then I'll interview people that we call mid-career, right? They've been working for 30 or 40 years. Some of them that's kind of end career, but they still think it's mid-career. Uh, but they have Eagle Scout on their resumes. I mean, these people have been working for a long time, and it's something they're very proud of, and it's something that makes them stand out from lots of other candidates for jobs. So uh, it's not all about jobs, but it's, what, it's really cool. Uh, to have that and you should never hide that at all. I think it's something you should put right out there because people it will catch people's eye and make you stand out. The other neat thing is just listening to all the different people they draw upon to make this happen. You know, we've got people all over Metro West basically helping to make these, these projects work and the experience you guys are getting reaching out to people and putting up with, you know, some people's sort of personalities and idiosyncrasies and things like that. That's all part of, of getting a job done no matter what it is. So. Uh, it's great for the community, it's great for you guys, and, and we're thrilled to have so many kids come through each year. So congratulations and well done. Thank you. Well, you know, and to that point that Mr. Herr and Mr. Ted Stone have mentioned about the importance of the Eagle Scout and how this becomes a part of you and it stays with <coughs> you throughout your entire life. And just today, I happened to be driving through um, Mount Auburn Cemetery, and there was a stone on this gentleman's grave. Clearly he, was, he, he lived a long life, and the one thing he had on his stone was always an Eagle Scout. What that said that out of his whole lifespan, the one defining fact that was put there for all to see, always an Eagle Scout. And that just said so much to me about the depth and the importance of what you've achieved. And I love both your projects. I love every time we see these, there's something, there's a variety. I've never heard of one that had to accommodate horses. Um, Austin, I love the fact, I read, I read over the description in advance of the meeting of your project. You help the seniors, you build a <coughs> butterfly garden and bird sanctuary for the enjoyment of the seniors. This, this, the breadth of, of the Eagle Scout's work that young and old, and there's just a beauty and a gentleness, all things great and small, get touched by your work. And um, the young men today don't have their Eagle badges yet or their eagle neckerchiefs, but as I always like to mention, um, when they receive them, it's the American colors of the red, white, and blue, and what they symbolize and what it speaks to is the red of courage and the white of honor and the blue of loyalty. And those elements that you express are just so valuable and frankly so needed in today's society. And I just know that you got you guys will just go forth and do wonderful things because you've built such a strong foundation. Um, so we're just so proud of you, and I can't wait to see you in a couple weeks. And um, we have some nice certificate proclamations for you. So if you come up, and we want to make sure we get some photographs. Yes, we definitely want to get some photographs. Let's. Uh, what have we got? We've got. Awesome. <laughs>
need my glasses. Austin, well, let's get a photo of that. By process of elimination, this is like Jordan. Austin. Let's get up here and get a nice time. photograph. Your dad grew up in town. Okay, Hi, little everybody. Can we There's Next on our agenda, we have a parade permit, and this is for the Hopkinton Little League Opening Day Parade and a special temporary alcohol license annual fundraiser. The Board of Selectmen will consider approving a parade permit and a special temporary alcohol license for Amanda Robichaud and Jason Mahan on behalf of the Hopkinton Little League. One, a parade permit, opening day parade, is on Sunday, April 28th, 2019 at 11.30 a.m. Road closures are requested for Main Street from the Town Common to 85 Main Street. And two, the special temporary alcohol license is for wine and beer only for an annual fundraiser on Friday, May 17, 2019 from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. at the St. John's Parish Hall. Marty's and Startline <coughs> Brewery will be supplying the alcohol for the event and TIP certified servers will be serving alcohol. Expected number of attendees is 200. So is there anyone, someone here to represent the Little League? Come up, please. And I think we should probably take these as two separate votes. Mm. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening and to you. You are? Jason Mahone, I'm the president of Hopkinton Little League. Great. Well, I know we've done this before, at least yes, the parade. So there's, I don't know, does the board have any questions for Jason about the parade permit or about, well, let's do the Where parade. does the parade take place? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so a comment, I don't know, is this where we would do a comment? Absolutely. So, Question comment. Um, so Jason, how long have you been on the uh, board in Little League? The board? Oh, seven years. And it's my third year as president. Third year as president. Yep. So this is at least my kid's third year uh, playing Little League. And these guys, they do a great job uh, from top to bottom on this Little League. The, the parade is well thought out. They do a good job organizing it. Um, it's, uh, it's quick. Uh, the, the, the ceremony at the field is, uh, is, is succinct and meaningful, uh, and uh, it's, you guys do a good job. So Thank you. I've been, uh, I've been a participant in this from 8 to 13 and, uh, years of age, and now as a parent I've been uh, a participant by, uh, by watching and uh, flawless. You do an absolutely awesome job. Thank you very much. Excellent. Other comments from the board members? Well, I want to say thank you to for this year coordinating with our neighbors uh, at our house of worship, the Korean Presbyterian Church, and putting that at 11:30. Um, it just helps everybody. It helps parents who want to want to attend services. And uh, as one who's often late to church, I know the last thing you need is to not be able to get into the parking lot. <laughs> so uh, that half an hour made a great difference last year, and we appreciate you just Good. no problem baked it into the cake this year. And I'm, I'm glad it worked out. Excellent. And I saw you there last year. I hope you had a good time. Yep, I Madam got Chair, it. I'd like to make a motion to approve the parade permit and to, to, I mean, to just the parade permit. Let's you do want the to parade permit. And may, may, the, the parade permit for the opening day parade on Sunday, April 28th at 11.30 a.m. 
Second. Second. Mo motion has been made and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. Good luck. And the temporary alcohol license for the fundraiser. This looks like it's a usual standard. So with that, Madam Chair, I'd like to make a motion to approve the temporary alcohol license for wine and beer only for the annual fundraiser on Friday, May 17th from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. at St. John's Parish Hall. Second that. Are there any other questions or comments before we vote on this? So this one's just a little bit different than the parade. Yep. This sure. one includes alcohol. Correct. So it's a little uh, more... Um, of something everybody has to watch That's right. and be careful with, right? So, and whoever gets the license, the, the, the one day license kind of has their name on it. Just saying. Yep, understood. Thank you. That's good. Okay, then having said that, a motion has been made and seconded to approve the special temporary alcohol license. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? And that is unanimous, and thank you. Good thank luck. Thank you very much. Hope the weather cooperates with that parade. So far, so good. <laughs> if I may, if I may, so yes. there's a request also for a fee waiver. And I think it's included in the draft motions. Oh, I would, I'd uh, like to make a motion to waive any fees associated with Second. this. All right, motion made and seconded to waive the fee for the uh, alcohol license. All those in favor? So is there a fee for the parade permit, too? I don't think so. I believe so. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So is your motion to waive yes. both fees? Yes. Okay. It is. Yeah, friendly amendment. All right. So we're amending this to waive the fees for the parade permit and the temporary alcohol license. Mm -hmm. And that was seconded. Yes, it was. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that too is unanimous. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you very much. I expect a tie on opening day. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see what I can do. I miss those parades. Those are fun. Come on up. We're going to tailgate. Hey there. <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> so, Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Thanks a lot. All right. Well, we have a couple minutes to go. We're actually ahead of schedule for our next two <laughs> I was just looking over it. That felt like it was the three minutes. So there's nothing we can do in three minutes but stretch our legs, I guess. I think we can get through the Main Street Corridor project in three minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can we do budget update um, number 10? Number what 10? is it, number 10? What's the liaison report? Sure. I have to think of my stuff first. Uh, well, we can start. We can start on liaison reports. Does anybody have something they'd like to contribute? I have nothing to report. Makes it quick. I have an elementary school building committee meeting uh, Thursday, I believe, and uh, no, I'm sorry, it's tomorrow, and um, I have been uh, kind of a little bit more active in the open space meeting, so those are, those are good uh, stress-free meet, so <laughs> that's all. And I had a meeting with the BAA about the, um, <coughs> this, this year we're doing a, uh, uh, a little more for the first mile. Last year, the, many of the, uh, uh, we had a lot of sponsors that, that had banners, if, if anybody noticed, do the first mile from the start, mm -hmm. right down past uh, Western Nurseries and stuff. And uh, this year we're going to uh, match the um, finish line, where the finish line has uh, the, uh, the last few miles, they have uh, three blue lines. Most uh, most of the the uh, international marathons have a blue line going the whole 26 miles, so people know what the course is. Sort of like the Freedom Trail that has the bricks. But what we're gonna we're gonna try and match the um, the finish line, and we're gonna have it uh, three lines doing this doing the first mile, mm -hmm. going just just off off center. It's it's a temporary line that that, that goes away at, after a couple of rainstorms. So hopefully it's not going to be raining, and that's going to be that'll be the um, we're going to have a a rolling out ceremony um, uh, April the Monday I think it's like Monday April eighth in, in the morning the, the Monday before yes the Monday before 
not to be dumb, but what's the is the blue line like a, a police support thing, or what's the significance? No, it's, of a, the blue it's so line they know. Business? So it's so uh, with um, marathons, they know. Uh, it's, oh, too bad Jack's still not here. So the runners know know the route. So you just follow the blue line. Um, and uh, uh, most of the uh, New York Marathon, Chicago Marathon, the international marathons all have a blue line. And uh, bo um, the uh, Boston Marathon doesn't. Um, they only have it uh, through Boston. And um, so we're trying to capture it here in Hopkinton also. And if the other towns want to want to do it later on, they can. But uh, we want to um, expand our marathon footprint and really um, brand that, the, the first mile. How can you miss it with thirty thousand people? <laughs> <laughs> right, but it gets it gets well, it gets thinner. It gets thinner later. Well, this is the, you know this is this is more taking uh, you know taking uh, uh, taking control of that first mile and, and and actually branding it. This is we, we are the start. Yeah. Okay. It's, 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 well. I see. Okay, good. It all starts here. All right. I think I'm going to hold on uh, Mr. Nazarula's reports and mine because it is now 7.15 and we do have a posted public hearing. So, um, 7.15, we have a posted public hearing for Bittersweet Company, Common Vigiler License, Section 12 Beer and Wine Alcohol License and Entertainment License 22 to 24 Main Street. The Board of Selectmen will hold a public hearing relative to, one, Section 12, Restaurant Wine and Malt and Beverages Annual License Application from Sharon Dunn on behalf of Oliveira and Dunn DBA Bittersweet Company 2224 Main Street to operate a food establishment 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Saturday and 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Sunday and two to entertainment license to allow events to be held on Wednesday through Saturday evenings from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Proposed manager of record is Mark Peronti, in addition to the entertainment license, the Board of Selectmen will consider issuing a common vigiler license, which does not require a public hearing. Further, a special permit is required from the Board of Appeals for live commercial entertainment in the downtown business district. So I would like a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor of opening the public hearing say aye. 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 And opposed? That is unanimous, and CJ, I see you out there. Come on up. <clears throat> so, um, there has been some more feedback from yeah, some I of just our permitting agencies. Um, so, I'm not sure. Yeah. Are you <clears throat> We're going to need some more time to address these, I um, Yeah, I mean, there's nothing here that um, can't be addressed or won't be addressed. And in fact, the information for the health board will be there in the morning, as will the occupancy load. I did submit a drawing with the occupancy on it, actually. Um, I don't know why you didn't get it, but I'm only seeing these for the first time, so I guess I need to review them myself and, and just yeah. answer any questions. Do you have a... Um, a, a date specific that you were planning on your opening can you afford to we, we could ask a number of our questions relative to what we've got sure. right now yeah but great. it looked like from what I saw from the fire department mm -hmm. uh, and the and the health there are some things that still need answered can you afford to figure what, what's your I'd like to open target yesterday. Date? I'd like to open yesterday if I could, you know. I know. Uh, um, I know. So I ideally, you know, we nice. were, we're pushing for the end of April, you know, uh, four to six weeks' time. Our next meeting is the 9th, so possibly we can get some of this done tonight and tie up the loose ends. Would it be possible to get it all done tonight with approvals pending satisfaction of these? That's what I would like to ask, yeah, that would be. I get that we can't, uh, our colleagues have got some concerns, sounds like they're going to get addressed, but you know, until that's, they are addressed, it would be inappropriate, I think, to have a license fully issued, but if we could pass it or vote on it pending those getting a, the issue not, the license not being issued until those things get addressed, the town manager could oversee that or something like that, I don't know. I personally am all for this 
concept? You, you know, I, I guess so part and parcel of this for me is, is a process. If, if they had been outlined to me last week when the packet went in, I would have had the information for them today, obviously. But um, with the exception of the health board, which I knew we were, were just waiting on one drawing, um, but nothing has really changed from a, a kitchen perspective, or uh, it's exactly as it's going from bitter sweet from 28 into 22, 24. The occupancy load is calculated by the engineer, and he has done so. And I did submit a, a, a copy of it. Um, all the egresses are marked, all the fire exits on it are, you know, all of this has been satisfied in this particular drawing. I just, it, he may not have had that particular drawing, it changed several times in the last couple of weeks. Yeah, I think the people in Hopton have very much missed Bittersweet, and I know we've received a number, I have, uh, and we've received a number of letters of support, and, um, you know, so... Frankly, I'm, I'm delighted that you found another solution and you're going to remain in the downtown. I think you bring a ton to the downtown and the things you're proposing are fun and exciting and, and really speak to some needs. So I, I, I think, you know, you've got some, you've got some great potential here. I, I am worried about the, the, the size of some of the requests, the questions right now. Um, I, I, Things like the grease trap that the um, <coughs> Board so of Health... That now, now yeah, so I filed an exemption for it uh, with the DWP um, last week or the week before on the advice of uh, Sean McAuliffe, the Health Director, because it's a very similar situation to 28 uh, in that they'll probably look, look for me to put a system in the basement underneath the sinks, which is what I had, because of, he knows the, the system at the back of the buildings, and he said that's it's grease ex ex exempt basically. So I put the application in, I just haven't heard back in time for the meeting. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I would imagine that that's going to be approved because there's no alternative, I believe. Right. If I may, Madam Chair, that, that, I remember I, I actually uh, helped uh, with the uh, grease trap at, at, at your old suite. Yeah. And one of the issues there is that we have to check in with Westboro, I yeah. believe. And we have to go by Westboro's um, I, I remember we used the electric dipper right. at, uh, at one point, and then they and then they um, they said that one's no longer um, they, they, they they have a whole new regulation. Um, but I remember that was a that that, that was a couple months that, that, uh, yeah. that took them to, to get to get through that one. That that one can be tricky, um, but uh, but that's the that's the point of what we should do around that one. I believe the DPW director might be able to answer that question about the Westboro needs for the wastewater. Share it on the team. Mr. Westerling, do you, can you? Yeah, no, that, that, that I just here? I just remember that was because Mr. Westerling worked out really hard getting these getting the, the first bittersweet open. Uh, if I may, through the chair, uh, regulations do allow for an. Under the sink, I don't mm -hmm. think it's any longer the big dipper. We we've, we've changed it, but it's in the regulations. We no longer have to go to Westboro. It's in our regulations, so we can work with the applicant. And where do things stand with the parking situation um, from our sure. so materials? You were <coughs> trying to negotiate something with some shared. Based on the occupancy um, that, was, that Elaine and I calculated during the week, um, we would need nine car parking spaces in total. There are three to the rear of the building, mm -hmm. uh, three to the front of the building, and the additional parking would come from 17 Main Street, directly opposite the building. And I have permission from the landlord there, Tom Carey, to uh, have access to that parking for the purpose of guests using the cafe. So you have um, have an uh, agreement now in place? I do, that? yeah. I now have to go through zoning, planning. planning, planning just to do the administration on it. So, Elaine, on, on something that's dependent on planning board, whatever we would issue would be contingent upon their getting because the planning board is the one that gives that approval. That's correct. So could we issue something without planning board having given their approval that I don't want to put the cart before the horse? Or they could have fewer seats until that approval is received. Do we know when planning board's going to be taking this up? There's been no application submitted yet. Okay. So worst case scenario, 
you could open without getting before planning board approves it and only be able to use a smaller yeah. amount of the seating and to have so really soft yeah, no no open. it's fine yeah we've, we've been through this i would have to use uh 46 or less mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so okay <clears throat> well i see the the fire chief uh chief slayman there and i know that you have a number of uh questions as well um Chief, your, your feelings, is this something that can be resolved soon or um, it's more just a matter of doing your inspections or uh, what are your thoughts right now? And now I see there's a building inspection required as well. That would be with the municipal inspections. Yeah, so I met with the building department today. Um, we don't have enough information between our two departments to be able to review what's going to be in there or give you comments. So okay. I don't know how to elaborate on that. There's, it's missing a lot of information okay. that we would normally comment on. Okay. Do you feel that it's of, of a nature that could get resolved in the next couple of weeks? Is it? When you're absent that, it's it's hard for me to comment on right. It's absent on right. a lot of information. But I, yeah. It's absent a lot of information. And the building department needs to do an inspection as yeah, well. Yeah, I talked with them, they agreed. I asked, I asked them questions when I'm reviewing it and they're not able to give me feedback on reviewing the occupancy load, the yeah. design pieces to it. Um, they're, they're missing documents if you would. Yeah. That <clears throat> okay. If I may, you know, so I began the process several weeks ago and have attended meetings regularly with the building department and with the um, with different departments in the town, but when it comes particularly to the building department, every two weeks when I satisfied a group of their requirements, there were some new requirements, and it kept going like this for the last six or eight weeks. Um, so much so my architect stepped down mid-project uh -huh. because there was, there was differences of, of uh, opinions, you know, and uh, I sent the information that the architect sent me to the town and said, can you answer this, you know, please, because he's quit, basically. And... Um, you know, he didn't come back onto the project, but I was lucky to pick up somebody else very quickly on it. But we, I was going to stick to three units next door, not just two of them. And I had the plans done up for all three, completed, and went to the town, and my occupancy would have been 135 people. And lo and behold, I can't do that because I need a suppression system in each unit. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I began the process on January 4th. And, um, you know, if I had a list of the do's and don'ts right back then, I probably would have been a lot more equipped for this meeting today. The reason why I wanted it submitted, you know, I guess was um, I wanted to get as much of this done as possible tonight. And then if there was anything I needed to tie up, I would have it. Um, I mean, both, both these sets of questions, the drawings that, that the fire chief needs will be here in the morning. Um, in fact, they're probably here now, but they just didn't meet this 5 p.m. deadline, purely because we were just making sure that we were triple checking everything on it and that it was to code but the engineer and the people working on it are super efficient and super um, uh, technical I guess and, and they follow every code that's out there they're not going to compromise it I guess some of our challenges were um, uh, wheelchair accessibility um, and the amount of investment that's going to have to go into that to bring the, build the two buildings together so and that's really what he was just finishing today was trying to get that in so that it fit, it fit aesthetically and obviously everybody, you, you know, it met code. And uh, so, so those drawings are going to be here in the morning, um, I guess, with, that will answer all of that. And the Board of Health drawings will be with it. So I don't think there'll be any major problems in either one because I've been working on them with both departments from the very beginning. So it was just because that changed last week, we went from three buildings to two. Yeah. It kind of changed the whole layout, yeah. Are there questions on the part of the board for the information that we do have that's been submitted? Well, comment is <coughs> partnering with uh, Mr. Carey. You certainly uh, grabbed the right person to, to work with. He's one of the most accommodating business owners and <coughs> individuals that I've come across in this town for a long time. So I'm sure he'll do anything in his property. In his yeah, I'm uh, very grateful for it, yeah, yep. absolutely. Yeah. Madam Chair, I don't have any questions. Um, I'd love to see this happen sooner than later, but it does seem there's a lot of loose ends that we need to just tighten up. Um, 
So maybe the thing to do is just continue the hearing until we get a little bit more information. Our yeah. next meeting, we can do it. I, 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 well, I see. For, for me, I just don't want the Board of Health, the Building Inspector, Public Safety, the Planning Board, all to say, "Wait a minute, how could you guys yeah, yeah. grant it before we?" You know, it's like what, and now. Now, if Ms. Lazarus said, "Oh yeah, it's already submitted," that would be one thing. But if it's, it, you know, it, it's yeah. this is the cart before the horse right now. And, I, and I, as much as we all want to rush you through. I think that we'd be shirking yeah. our responsibility, when, especially when it comes to the alcohol license, because we were just doing that one-day license, and Mr. Hurst uh, um, made sure that the uh, uh, Little League <laughs> knew, yeah, sure. and that was just for one day. So I don't know if Mr. Mr. Hurst would give a lot, of, a lot of contingencies on this one just to cover it. Yeah, there's just a lot. Yeah, there, there are a lot, and and you know, <clears throat> I guess the reason sometimes I, I kind of hold the line on these permits is we put the request out to our permitting agencies and we ask for their input, and we value that, and should respect their concerns. So, um, you know, if there are things remaining with the fire department or the board of health, I, I am. It's sounding like you've got this all kind of in the works, and it's just almost almost but not quite. Sure. Um, I would like to continue this till April 9th and hope that we can find something there on April 9th to um, get this in. And if you've got, if we get, you know, all, what we really want is these permitting comments to say no problems, no problems, no sure. problems. And and, you know, if I, had a, if I hadn't had them this morning or yesterday, yeah. they would have been answered, but coming in this evening, I, I didn't have the opportunity to do it. One, and you know, I, I, I accept your decisions. I think it's right. You know, we want to get there, but we want to have sure. have the piece. So we are at 7:30, which is another public hearing. But I would suggest that we continue the public hearing until April 9th, if we can, um, and hopefully we will That'd get this wrapped up. Sure. Then. Yeah. 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 Works. Sir. It's a public hearing, correct? Yes, it is. Um. We're continuing it. We are going to continue it. Um, you know what? Well, you know what? I can do. Wait one minute. Let me. Oh, I'm going to open the 7:30 public hearing and ask them to hold for a minute, and then I will. I'll come to your okay. remark. So the hour being, if you will wait, the hour being 7:30, we have a scheduled public hearing, and this is for um, a street acceptance. The board of selectmen will hear from the public regarding the proposed acceptance of Hunters Ridge Way and Petty Meadow Lane as public ways. The planning boards recommend approval. Department of Public Works will conduct final inspection when the weather permits. The board of selectmen has submitted an article <coughs> at, on the 2019 annual town meeting warrant which requests acceptance of the streets. Motion so, to open the motion open to public open hearing. public hearing. M made, is there a second? Second. Second, all those in favor of opening the public hearing say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. And I think Mr. Westerling, you're probably here to speak to that with your forbearance. Uh, if we can hold just another minute and we'll finish up this Mr. agenda Nation's item. Here also. Yes, yes, Mr. Nation too. Um, sir, you did have a comment, please. Uh, your name and address, please. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Keith Regan. I live at 13 Walcott Street. Okay. Um, I, uh, I was just a little surprised. I think you went kind of fast over the parking issue. Um, this board just a few weeks ago was saying how bad parking is downtown. Um, you made an agreement with the developer to try to add some parking to downtown. Um, I have a question about whether uh, the numbers that Mr. President presents about the parking uh, that it actually has available are right. Um, if anything, he's providing and able to provide a bare minimum. And as I said, this board just a few weeks ago said this is essentially a crisis, and I just want to give you a little more flavor of, of that. I happen to live just down the street around the corner. Um, when 42 Main Street came in, um, there was a lot of uh, parking that was added, much of it was added on the street. Uh, but nonetheless, we have illegal parking that takes place every day at the corner of Walcott and Main and all along here on Main Street. Um, part of that is enforcement, can be addressed by enforcement. Part of it is just we're at capacity down there. Um, and I just ask you to take another really good look at the parking uh, being considered here and whether the mitigation uh, of the parking demands are being met, whether they're being met the same way that other licensees have done. And again, I just mentioned 42 Main Street, and you can see the, the parking out there. Obviously, these are different scales of. 
of operations, but nonetheless, um, I think you already have a problem. I think it's more than a nuisance. I think it is a nuisance, and I think it deters business. And I want to be clear, I have no problem with the use being proposed, and I have no problem with uh, those properties being actively used. There's a reason they've been vacant as much over the last 10 years as they have. Um, and I think parking has a lot to do with that. And I, I'm just not sure uh, if maybe you should maybe recheck, as I say, whether he's met the, your requirements. It's one thing to meet the minimum requirements <coughs> in the zone dialogue. But you have a higher authority as a license uh, yeah. process. So yeah. that's all I want to say. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I will say, and Mrs. Lathers might help us with this too, a couple of years back in an effort to bring more business into downtown and recognizing that it's an old downtown, doesn't have the parking area, the board, I believe it was the plane, we did enact special parking requirements for the downtown which were less than, say, a brand new development. Um, and, you know, with the understanding that there was on-street parking available or whatever, mm -hmm. that could absorb it, except now there's a lot of businesses that are all calling on that. Um, Mrs. Lazarus, if you could just speak um, to how this, uh, the nine spaces meet the requirements. The number is based on the number of restaurant seats, the number of employees on the largest shift of mm -hmm. the business. And so there's a calculation in the bylaw. So, I mean, it does meet based on our current regulations, whether those are adequate now based on the in increased pressures. Well, I quite, I, I'm not sure there's three spots on the street, given that if you're just looking at 22 to 24, I'm not sure there's three. <coughs> but maybe I'm not sure how that, maybe the partial spots get counted. Sure. Because I read the bylaw, they have to be within the side plot lines, isn't that correct? But even if there's, even if, you know, if we lose one space out front and it's five in total, mm -hmm. um, Mr. Kerry's car park across the street at 17 Main has double what I actually would need to, to um, and I know traffic is such a, or parking is such a problem in the town, but what I do notice is that you can park anywhere you want during the day since we've been closed. Sure. And, you know, really, 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 I, I asked Tom for the use of the car park at night and at weekends, and I think um, it'll help take some of that traffic away from from the town if I have that space available to me, you know. I know it's been a big problem in the town, and I know there's issues with, uh, you know, Hoppington Drug and using that space, so, you know, Tom was very gracious to offer me this, and um, I think it will actually solve a bit more problems than, than, than add to it, because there'll be a lot more spaces made available, three times what, what I need for code, really. Yeah, I would just ask if there's going to be an agreement, you know, again, that agreement would satisfy a planning board requirement, like so that off-site parking that's not the standard that you have to necessarily adhere to. Um, but if you're going to count that, I would think you'd want some kind of uh, evidence that that agreement exists, some kind of bonding that that parking is going to be available. Because if it goes away, then what happens? Um, and, and I just want to be clear. As I said before, the parking is a nuisance, but it's becoming a hazard now, too. There's constantly illegal parking that's blocking pedestrians uh, from the view of drivers. There's illegal parking that uh, encroaches on, on crosswalks. Um, there's legal parking that I think would make it impossible for an emergency vehicle to get that walk on the street that have to. Um, and I think, as I said before, you all know that because you just said so. So I'd ask you to take that into consideration. Thank you. Madam Chair, Thank you. Thank you. I think it, it, he raises an excellent point. Absolutely. It's a fair point. We have Absolutely. to, as he said, we have discussed parking sometimes ad nauseum uh, without getting into uh, details of executive <coughs> session discussions. There is an active effort in this community to enhance downtown parking uh, that all of us will have to support at some point, but we're not there yet. So we're working. People are on it. Yeah. And, and and I would also say that it it's a it's a problem that is borne by all the town the downtown, um, and it can't it cannot be you know put just on one business owner. It, it, it's a shared problem. Right. Um, sir, yes, please. Yes, I, I just want to emphasize. Uh, to turn that around, actually, all the burden has been put on one. It's all been put on Walcott Street. You add the parking spaces on Walcott Street, and then you add a ton of traffic to it. Um, the sidewalk's insufficient. There's a spot where there's a double pole uh, where you have to walk into the street. Um, the parking's on either on opposite sides now, so it creates kind of a solemn effect. It slowed the cars down for maybe three weeks, and now everybody's figuring out they have fun driving down there again. Um, so it's it's a hazardous situation. It's not just a nuisance. Or, uh, yeah, you know, uh, uh, I have an impingement on an economic development. No. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Okay. Thank right. you. Oh, Come on. Hold on, Mr. Mr. Carey.
No, come on up. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I didn't see you, Mr. <coughs> Carey. Come up, anytime please. I, anytime I can make you squirm. <laughs> um, this is Mr. No, Mr. Mr. Carey, Tom Carey. I'm involved in a Carey. commercial. I'm sorry, my name is Tom Carey. Thank you. And I'm the owner of the property across the street. Yes, 17. 17. And I have indeed, you know, as a friend, it's not a rental arrangement or anything like that. As a friend, I think CJ is a wonderful guy. I think he's an asset to the town. Yes. And um, I really want to see him succeed. Um, you know, I'm proud that he's trying to found a business and really, you know, he's a, he wants to make it in America. I think it's great. I recognize that parking is a problem in this town. I'm involved in a building in the center of town in Westboro, and I'm involved in a building <coughs> people are probably all parked. Anybody here been to John Stones? Yeah. Not today. Oh, yes, John Stones, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you probably sure parked in the parking lot. We own the parking lot behind John Stones. Uh -huh. They don't have enough parking. They can't make it without parking. Mm. So what we do is we allow them to use our parking by night. Sure. And our dentists that are in our building use their parking by day. And we kind of coexist to one, another, one another's benefit. And it is so much better than some of what I see going on with other parking lots. <laughs> so, you know, I think we have just question what we have with the healthy gen, and it's definitely yes. Yeah. No, and, and the other thing I see is that a lot of the parking, I've lived here for years, on the street at night, the meetings here in town are what, Mondays through Thursdays? Is, is that correct? Yeah. You, Monday hmm. through th Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Okay. You're busy. It's night to be Friday. It's Saturday, Saturday, yeah. You, you mean so that it's kind of like going to be for John, like how it is for John Stone's me. Mm -hmm. When we're there, yeah. they're not. Opposite yeah. hours. And when they're rocking on, you know, St. Patrick's Day weekend, we're not there. So it, yeah. you know, it works. Thank you. All right. Thanks, John. Thank you, Mr. He's a great guy, but I want to see him make it. Your attitude is what we need more of in this town because we don't need to pave the entire downtown. We need to work a w find a way that we all work together to make downtown succeed. So I'm, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. We'll see you on the ninth. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, I apologize for the delay, but thank you, um, Mr. Nation and Mr. Westerling. Uh, if you'd like to come up, and we will take a look at the street acceptances. This is Mr. Nation. Mr. Nation is the developer of Penny Meadow uh, and Hunters Ridge too, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct, Chris correct. Nation. Okay, John. <clears throat> if I may, Mr. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Uh, Terry has not invited this comment. But it needs to be said that, ironically, I think back to three, four years ago, the solution, getting Penny Meadow Lane to the level where it is now, uh, moving forward to town meeting for acceptance, had to do in large part with our conversations with Mr. Terry. Yeah. With Mr. Carey. Yeah, Mr. Carey, sorry. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. And a few years back, the planning board did a study, a, a parking survey, during the different hours and found there was quite a bit of parking that was not used in the off hours. It's a matter of, well, there's, it's a multi-pronged solution, but it is unfortunate when we have a lot of unused parking. That but that was also before the central central house also. But no, but there's... Maybe the new central there house, is still not the old I'm confused. One. Are we on Penny Lane or what are we okay, doing Okay, we are on, we're on Penny Meadow Lane and Hunter's Ridge. Um, Mr. Westerling. Would you like to tell us um, your findings on both these roads? Uh, look to me like there's a bit of an issue on Penny Meadow with some pavement. Um, where do we stand? Madam Chair, thank you very much. Through you, uh, we did an, an evaluation of both of those roads and we found them to be in condition that's ready for acceptance, subject to the reports of the planning board's engineer. Mm -hmm. Once all of that work is satisfied, they will be ready. There is a matter of a required easement on Penny Meadow Lane. The actual pavement width was paved outside and onto private property for a small portion, small area. I did speak with the, the resident, and uh, so the, the resident there is fully aware of the requirement and the need for an easement. 
and I defer to Mr. Nation as to the, the standing of that, that proposal. For so the that meeting. two feet of excess pavement, it's not the full length of the road, it's just on an individual lot? For a portion of an individual lot. Yeah. Would the, uh, it's uh, one foot four inches wide and it stretches the course of uh, roughly 40, 50 feet. Okay. Uh, the property owner has been given easement documents to sign. They've indicated that they will sign those upon review. And um, as soon as they're signed, I'll have them back and recorded and given to the town. So when I looked at the materials that were sent to the board a couple <coughs> days ago, at that point, I know you said you were going to look into could that possibly be cut, and if not, then you'd have to get the easement. So you can't, you can't remove, you find you can't remove the pavement. You have to go with the easement to leave it there. Uh, to, to back up on that, it, it, the approved plan does reflect that the pavement went over that uh -huh. line, but no one picked up on a specific request or need at the time to have that become an easement uh, to get the rec to get the 18 feet in the plan due to what happens on the other side of the road due to there's some ledge and some grading issues there the road just pushes to that side just enough and uh, it's it's right at 18 feet now so okay. to, to cut it shorter creates a different problem so you you really need to leave it there you just need to let the that get seems the like the appropriate thing to me okay okay and so, <clears throat> you know, on, on paper, this is hard to even see unless it's blown up um, to a larger scale. You know, the, <coughs> the printed line absorbs this overage on the, on the asphalt plan. But to Mr. Westerling's point, from what I read, like there was an um, Oversized, undersized pipe, I guess, was 10 instead of 12 or whatever. The engineer said that's, that's not, a, not a problem with, with the capacity. It seemed like the main outstanding thing was that extra bit of pavement because we don't want to accept that road and then the easement or the cost of obtaining easement be on the town. So I, I will open up to the rest of the board, but it sounds to me from what I looked at that we could approve the street acceptance <coughs> tonight with the contingency that that be resolved, and if by some chance we get to town meeting and it's not resolved, then Mr. Westerling, you would recommend not accepting. And that, that is just on Penny Meadow. Hun Hunter's Ridge seemed to be all in order, correct? Correct. Yes, that's correct. Other members' questions? I have no questions. I have no questions. Jeez, I remember when this came up on the planning board. I have no questions on it. Uh, just one question on the, there was a issue about a pipe. Yeah. Yeah. And are we satisfied with the, with the response? Through the chair, I am. Yes. That's good. Two pipes. One's yes. too big, one's too small, but they're yeah. both okay with the engineers. Yes. So, Mr. Kamala, are you in, in accord that um, we could approve this with a contingency that the easement situation be resolved by the developer? Um, and if not, we then it would be recommended at town meeting not to accept Penny Meadow. Can we approve it with a contingency? Yes, I am. Okay. All right, would someone, is it in my motions document? I don't know. I don't you so. read it. Is it in the motions document? Through, Issue. Oh, through the chair. Yes, Mr. Coutinho. Oh, okay. Come out. Oh, there are 100 people in attendance. I'm sorry, it is a public hearing. Yeah, I yes. always forget this. Yeah. Are there members of the public who would like to comment or ask a question? Mr. Carey. I'll just say, I live on Penny Meadow Lane also by coincidence. <laughs> and um, they did a great job step up to the front of Lace. Come on up. Sorry. The folks at home can't see you. By coincidence, I happen to live on Penny Meadow Lane. The nation's did a great job on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody's happy. It was a bad situation. It just was a, not a good situation prior to the solution that Norman proposed. John did a great job. And everybody in the street, I think a different body here, would you say? Yeah. Everybody very happy to. Yeah, it worked out wonderfully. Right. 
we're happy and, and we thank want you. it to be a town road. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So Excellent. So we should close the hearing. Okay. Uh, are there any comments, other further public comments or questions? Seeing none, uh, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify it by saying aye. 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 And opposed. It is unanimous. The public hearing is closed. Um, and that's both roads? Excuse me? Is this regarding Penny Meadow and Hunter's Ridge? Well, it appears that, you know, why don't we take them separately? Um, I would request a motion to recommend that the annual town meeting vote to accept Hunter's Ridge Way um, as and for public ways and to authorize the Board of Selectmen to acquire by gift purchase or eminent domain any land or interest in land necessary for such laying out. So moved. Second. All right, all the, and this is Hunter's Ridge Way. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Madam Chair, if I may, quick comment. I took a ride down by uh, down through that Hunter's Ridge the other day. Great job on that. <clears throat> that development looks wonderful. Not that we would expect anything else, but you guys did a good job on that. Did okay. you vote in favor? I did. Okay, so that was, that was unanimous. Okay, um, Penny Meadow Lane, <clears throat> Shall I request a motion to recommend the annual town meeting vote to accept Penny Meadow Lane um, contingent upon uh, establishment of easement as required? Um, Chris, is it, it, we should assume that you should be able to get that done, right? I'm sorry, say that again? You should be able to get that easement all set by, by town meeting, right? I, I am, it is in the property owner, uh, we had two Penny Meadows hands. They have indicated that they will help us in this, okay. but without having it in my hands. Can't say definitively. But all signs point to a positive outcome. Okay. Okay, and that's two Penny Meadow where it is. That's correct. Okay, then I will request a motion to recommend that the annual town meeting vote to accept Penny Meadow Lane contingent upon resolution of, uh, um, upon, uh, what's the word I need? Is it acceptance? Is it? Um, upon receipt of an easement. Okay, thank you. Contingent upon receipt of easement at, for two Penny Meadow Lane and for public ways and to authorize the Board of Selectmen to acquire by gift purchase or own a domain any land or interest in land necessary for such laying out. Okay. Is that right, Elaine? That's right. Okay. So moved. Second. All right. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous. Okay. We're assuming it's going to be a go by town meeting. That's what we do. We just keep working on stuff till it's done. Do that. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> thank you, Chris, and thank you, Mr. No Weston. No. <laughs> hey, Chris, I think I have one of your scooters in my garage. <laughs> Declan came home with a scooter or something. That's right. How's that working? A black one? Send him a bill. If you're looking for it, that, that's where it is. Judge <laughs> storage. He's awesome. I was watching him. Cool. Okay. Main Street Corridor Project. The Board of Selectmen will receive an update from the town manager and the town engineer, facilities director Dave Del Torrio, on the 75% submission of the Main Street Corridor Project. Hello. Welcome, gentlemen. Tell us. Madam Chair, can we start at the end and work backwards, maybe? We'll start at the end. David, are we done yet? <laughs> well, we do, we're done with a lot of things, but huh? wanna... how close are we to 75%. construction? Oh, that's easy. Seventy-five percent went in last week. It went in. Okay, there's news. That's great. Good news. You're jumping ahead, though. No, we're done. <laughs> we're good. Don't mess things I'm up. I'm all set. All right. <laughs> Welcome, gentlemen. What have you got? 
Give us the story. Oh no. Password. Right there. Right on oh, the thank God. What are they doing to me? Um, I don't know if so, Norman was going to do an introduction or a start, yeah. or we just want to. Again, through the chair. Mr. Kamalo, please. It needs to be said loud and clear. The 75% design is now in the hands of Master OT. Okay. Uh, we have the engineering team alongside Dave to refresh the board on the different constituents or the different parts or components of the 75% design plan. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll just introduce uh, VHB. This is Matt Chase. Uh, he's the project manager. Um, Hi. VHB and Amanda Bazinet, um, who I think have done all the work. <laughs> um, Matt was just going to give a quick um, summary and update uh, of the you know the main changes of the project since we had our 25% um, mass stock public hearing. Uh, it's been a while, but. Um, 25% went in, as you know, a couple of years ago. We had the public hearing at the Senior Center. Uh, the feedback that we received from the town at that meeting um, went into the 75% design, uh, and, and there was some significant changes where, where Matt can kind of update uh, the board again on what those changes were. And, and so before we go a little further into that detail, just to your point, Mr. Kamal, and our, our initial yeah. question. So we have submitted the 75% plan in hard copy, electronically, and whatever, officially to DOT for their review. That, correct? That's correct. correct. What is the typical lead time or, or a review period that they have for something like this? So 60 days is the typical review time for DOT for the 75% submission. So they'll review and start to, we'll start to see comments from different departments over the next month. <coughs> some get them done earlier, some wait up right to the 60 days, it depends on the department. Um, but over the next two months, we'll see uh, comments coming back in. And in the meantime, we'll be working with the town to advance additional aspects of the project of working with the Historic Commission, the Garden Club, and other, uh, the Chamber, and other to fine tune uh, certain components of the design. I think the last time uh, we met and you heard uh, about the project and the changes, um, there were some significant redesigns to the corridor, as Dave said, as a result of things that came out of the public hearing. And a lot of that had to do with the intersection um, at Cedar and Grove, where we added additional turn lanes, uh, an additional um, turn lane coming down Cedar Street. Um, we <clears throat> removed the through lane on the westbound approach of Main Street into that intersection. And then we shifted the bike lane and put it on the south side of the roadway to make a two-way bike path. So it was a continuous two-way bike path for the full duration of the limits of, well, most of the limits of the project from Hayden Row out to Wood Street. So that is now uh, part, of, <clears throat> part of the project. Um, uh, Marathon Way is separated from where the Doughboy statue is. So that was connected at one point, but now it's, it's, it's separate. And that has been included as part of the design. Um, the efforts that have been ongoing to get to the 75% submission, uh, when we go through 25%, it's like it's a more of a two-dimensional design where we check some of the grading, but then the 75% of the design, we don't really change a lot of aspects of what was solidified in the 25%. We get into a lot more of the drainage design, <clears throat> the undergrounding, um, start looking at spot grades and, and grading the whole project as a whole. Um, as you know, the utilities from right around the fire station to Ash Street and maybe a little further out um, are going to be going underground. And this is probably the, the biggest, if not the biggest project that MassDOT has undertaken, uh, no pun intended, as an undergrounding project. And so they've kind of really embraced taking that on and having that be part of the project as part of the contractor that comes in to do this work where normally it would be a municipal's responsibility, a municipality's responsibility to do that work prior to um, the DOT coming in. So we've been working uh, extensively with them through the summer and fall of last year just to, to kind of end the utility companies to get all of the utility uh, information into the plans, work with them because we have to have meet certain requirements and setbacks from different utilities. Uh, Dave has the utility plans up and basically these plans are provided to DOT in color and each utility has a different color. So you can see the extensive amount of utilities that are going underground um, in this stretch, and this is at the main intersection here at Cedar Street and Grove. 
Um, but there are uh, a significant amount of undergrounding that has to go from the street to each building. So we have to chase the overhead wires and take the overhead wires and put them underground. So there's going to be a lot of coordination from this point forward to get the undergrounding into the houses, of, into each of the houses and make adjustments accordingly to, to those, um, to each business and homeowner within that, uh, within that stretch. So, so back to the timing for a minute. Yep. Um, so with the 75% submitted, 60 days for review, they come back with some ideas, they come back with some comments, then how much time do we have after that to incorporate that or sort that out? Do we get to 100%, which I assume is the next submission? So um, we'll get those back in 60 days. I think our 100% um, design submission is going in in July-ish, somewhere in that month. And then they'll have another 60 days to review. And then our per, uh, PS and E design will go in around, I think it's September or October, somewhere in that range. And what's um, the PS and E? Plan spec and estimate. So in addition to that's the bid documents, that's the that's kind of the fine tuning of the bid documents. Yes, that's the final. There's a couple other things that get added to that so that they can bid them. The one big thing that goes in as part of this submission is we have to write what we call the special provisions. So it's a word document writing in all instructions for certain things, specific things related to the project, um, for the contractor to have a guide of how to construct certain things. And who's bidding it? Are we bidding it, Dave, or is DOT bidding it? It's a DOT project. Um, okay. They actually do all the bidding, and all the contractors are pre-qualified to do mass dot work. Yeah. Uh, and the schedule uh, we have right now is, you know, the bidding should start sometime the end of this year. And it's usually, for projects this size, it might be a, a four to six, seven month bidding project. So, so we try to put a shovel in the ground in 2020 then? Yeah, yes, absolutely. We're sticking to that schedule. Do we have a um, date that we want to begin construction? After the marathon? After yeah, the marathon. After the marathon. Closer to March. It's hard to um it's hard to, to fine tune tune it that much before we even before it even goes out to bid and your contractor gets selected. Then you have your uh your your pre bid conference and while all that's going on you, you do some shop drawings and you figure so out layout okay, areas. So and, but it's, back it's up. Hard I, to, I don't I don't care how many bricks you're gonna put in the sidewalk. Yeah. I want to figure out the timing of this project so the residents of Hopkinton know when this is coming because I think it's important for a couple of reasons. So we're going to do 75, we're done 75%, we're going to get comments, that's two months. We're going to get to 100% here hopefully by September, I think I heard. And then we're going to submit that and hopefully have some kind of bid documents out by the end of the year. Is that Correct. a fair statement? So by the end of FY, 20, FY uh, by the end of 2019, calendar year, calendar year 2019, we hope Town of Hopkinton hopes to have the documents ready to bid to do this work on the Main Street Corridor. Cool. And then we'll bid it in the winter and spring of next year and try to get going in this thing after the marathon. And DOT will bid. Go. Correct. So that's the, great. The that is, that's big news. That's the first time we've ever had a conversation where we were talking dates and talking actual construction. And I think it's realistic. I'm in the construction industry, so I get all this. And I think that's realistic and I think it's legit and I'm really excited. Now you can talk about how many bricks are going to go on the sidewalk. Right? No, <laughs> we're, we're doing that. But now you said, um, you said the municipality is responsible for the undergrounding part because we're paying that. When you say responsible for it, but DOT still So in, it. in a traditional undergrounding project, um, the municipality usually has to undertake that and put that in before the state comes in and does their project. In this particular project, the state is now taking that on themselves. Part of so they're doing it on. They're doing it for for the municipality, and they're going to be overseeing the underground and construction and their project both at the same time. The town does have to pay. Right. They call it a non-participating cost right. for the undergrounding, but DOT's contractor will oversee that work. And at the end of the day, that tends to save you know money and time when you can have both go out at the same time. So instead of two separate projects, ours and then the other it's one, all, it's one stop it's shopping. One it's all rolled project. together. Good. Thank you. Uh, so one question, I don't know if this, this went over, I left room for a moment. The easements and all of that stuff, we have all that stuff in place to make sure we can, you know, I don't want some, you know, Mrs. Murphy's farm to hold it up at the last second, like at the end of 495 for 25 years. So I can speak to that yeah. process if you like. Um, so we've submitted 75%, so over the next 60 days we'll start getting some comments, and some of the comments we'll start getting um, back are uh, right-of-way comments, comments on our right-of-way plans. We have specific plans that call out temporary easements, easements for utilities, or um, permanent easements for sidewalks outside the layout, things like that. Um, those comments will start coming in. The design will continuously be refined over the next three to four months. 
Um, in the same time, the town's going to be working to bring on appraisers to do title research and to do appraiser and costs for each of the parcels that are identified as a taking or a temporary. Um, that'll be a process that has to strictly follow the DOT process. If it, if it doesn't follow that process to the T, uh, it could jeopardize the project going out the bid. So um, we've been working with Dave and Norman on, uh, with DOT, there's a representative that's assigned to the project to help the town every step of the way to make sure that the steps are followed properly. And we've started that process now and it'll continue. And this is the, when we get through this next 60 day period, we'll get, uh, we, we'll get an approval on the right of way plans and it'll give the town the authorization to move the next step forward to start to do more of the appraisals and then start doing some negotiations with property owners and look for donations and things like that. So that is a, it's a step-by-step -step process and there'll be a, a separate schedule that um, the state will advise the municipalities, this is what you do now, this is what you need to do next and you follow it through the process. Um, it will be a process that will be um, uh, an extensive process. It'll be something that'll have to be followed you know, to the T, but we've had several meetings with them so far to, to, to talk through it. And then the one point, um, that right away process, um, the only time it could start is when you hit the 75% submission actually goes in. So we really weren't able to do any work prior to that. So um, we're able to start it now. So, Madam Chair. So as far as the, the activities around the project now, that I would assume it's going to start to accelerate a little bit. It sounds to me like it would anyway. So Matt, Amanda, are you guys on this project every day or is this sort of a weekly check-in type thing at VHB or how is that? right now for you guys and how do you see that over the next six months well Amanda's smiling at me, like, <laughs> I'm smiling hours. because I worked on it every day for the last month Got including it. weekends so it has been a very time-consuming thing that we are focusing on um, now that the 75% design submission is in um, we will definitely still be thinking about it working on it on a weekly basis until we get our comments in from mass DOT um, it will not be an everyday thing. There will definitely be little things that we, we're tacking as we go. Um, but once we get those comments, it again will be a, a main focus that we'll be working on every day to hit the next deadline. So that's kind of how we work. Um, until we have DOT's comments, it's, it's, it's difficult to progress certain things Got because it. you don't want to. That makes sense. <clears throat> but there are certain things work. that we can continue to work through with the town to make sure that we have um, you know, certain features and aspects and things like that, that we start to fine tune between now and the end of the design, which is a typical process that we would follow. Okay. So we're not gonna be fully aggressively working on it like we have been, but we're not gonna go away either. Mm -hmm. Right, the town is gonna, the, the next step's on, on the town, <laughs> town engineer. Um, the right of way process, um, reaching out to residents. There's some um, working with the building inspection department um, to actually reach out and possibly do inspections of, of everybody's property um, so we can properly identify uh, the electrical upgrades and stuff and the electrical work interior to the structures. We're gonna be going to the Historical District Commission um, to get their approval and to make a formal um, submission for a certificate of appropriateness. Uh, we'll continue to work with the subcommittee that they put together. Garden Club folks we're gonna work with for the landscape architects. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Can't Good. do two things at once. So yeah. there, there are other kind of soft, yeah, I call them soft stuff, um, where Amanda's and, and to the team she's been working with have been working around the clock to, to get these utility plans together. Um, and again, the utility meeting was supposed to happen sometime in October last year, but we have eight, seven or eight different utilities. Um, and there was a delay between you know, we must have had 25 parties we had to get together for that meeting, DOT and the utilities and everybody else, and it didn't happen until January 10th. So uh, most of what you see on these plans has been done over the last six weeks. Um, so VHB really put their foot on the pedal. Um, so um, if the utility part is the town section and, and then there's the rest of the project and you said that it's, it's being all manage and coordinate it all as one, but you said the utility is done first. So does that mean that things are going to get torn up twice? Like first they'll do all the undergrounding and then they'll go back and start doing the rest or, or is it all going to be get done at the same time? 
it, it'll be a um, double disruption. It, it'll be it, it will be up to the contractor to set the schedule for um, how he goes about his construction. One of the things that we have to do is we do have to look at a, a construction schedule for the project as a whole. So we will be working to get a schedule over the next duration of the project design to identify that. Um, when it comes to means and methods for construction, if you're talking about undergrounding, if he's opening up the street to put in undergrounding utilities, he'll be, and he has to put in drainage for the project itself, he'll be doing that at the same time. Okay. Um, if he's doing um, widening for sidewalks or other things like that, like that'll happen in certain stages. He certainly won't rip open the road, put something down, come back, rip it open again. Mm -hmm. That's just bad practice. I can't sure. see that happening. Okay. Um, but there will be a means and methods to him doing certain things, and we are making sure that however they go about their work that it's staged appropriately um, around the start of the marathon so that, you know, this is anticipated to be two construction seasons. So at some point, he'll have to shift gears and focus on another part of the project and stay away from that area and make sure it's set and staged in an appropriate manner for, uh, for the next year's, um, you know, uh, or the 2021 or whatever it might be for, for that, uh, that year for that race. So to the greatest extent possible, you do try to coordinate the, the openings and the disruption to yeah. do multiple things at the same time. That's correct. And the contractor, there's specific language in the contract that he has to maintain access to businesses, to, to properties for pedestrian and, and vehicular, and, and he, can't, he has to stay away from certain uh, peak hours of travel times and, and that sort of so he doesn't um, disrupt some of the commuter peaks and, and some of that. So there'll be certain things that he can and can't do. Um, and that'll be all set in the, in the contract documents. So, so that, that was my other other question. I mean, I've driven through a lot of communities that have had these projects, and obviously there's disruption, but they've also survived. Um, but just I wondered, what are the logistics? How do they do this and uh, and guarantee or give the businesses some measure of of access? Do they do one side of the road first, or how, how do you work that so that businesses are not completely shut down they still have access and that, i mean that's they're going to for the most part they'll have to maintain two-way traffic and and the on corridor the is wide enough i think to accommodate that whether it's a shift he may work on this side of the roadway and have traffic go on this side work right. in the middle and have it go around the work zone yeah. i mean there's different ways that they can work that you will have a resident from mass dot that will be a representative for the project and he will be um, probably contacting directly Dave to schedule meetings with the businesses or with the town to have updates accordingly to talk about what construction, uh, what construction activities are coming up that next you know, week or two weeks and so that way everybody's informed and know what's happening. So that will be his responsibility from the DOT's resident perspective. There'll be a pre-construction meeting well before any work happens to be uh, to let the town know of what the schedule is. The contractor has to put a schedule together to share with the town and with DOT to say, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to work at the signal at this point. I'm going to do this over here. And, and so that'll be mapped out uh, you know, all, along the way and, and shared with the town so they're well informed of everything that's happening. By and large, if, businesses should be able to remain open. Yes. And the resident will need, to, will need to, to notify the businesses as when, if there's work and if they're pouring a sidewalk or something that might impact access to, sure. they'll have to make sure there's some sort of accommodations, but he will do that um, contact one-on-one -on -one with that property owner, either through Dave or directly with the mm -hmm. business um, as, as necessary during construction. Thank you. Mr. Kamal? If I may, um, two points. In our conversations with the Chamber of Commerce and local businesses, it has been made clear to us that this is one of the most important components of the plan and therefore is access and, yes pedestrian and vehicular access uh, along main street and therefore our goal is to continue to collaborate and coordinate the planning process uh, for pedestrian and ve vehicular access during construction with our local businesses. So this is not a plan that they will see when the resident engineer from Mass DOT shows up. We want to in, include them in the planning process because it has been expressed to us that this is very important. You also had asked a question earlier regarding the possibility of some work being done, the road covered, and then we come back and take. We want to remind the public that ever source is planning a gas main replacement project on Main Street. To date, 
we have sent several emails to Eversource asking that we receive the detailed plans, especially how they will manage the construction phase. And John, we have not heard back from Eversource. If, if I may, Madam Chair, because isn't there, a, don't they put a moratorium when a new road goes in um, by the state? Isn't there a moratorium for what, like up to three years or five years? Five years. It, yeah, so, so ever so it's better that they can't dig. The state puts in a new road. You road have opening to, permits. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're not allowed to open it up. In fact, through the chair, our goal here is that the Eversource project occurs before or ahead of the Mass DOT Main Street Corridor project. Well, yeah, time's so. getting short. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've been coordinating with Eversource Gas for a couple of years trying. with the design of this project uh, and theirs. And, and they have the plans, um, they have the 75% yes. plans that have been submitted. And BHB has been coordinating with them for for a couple of years now on this project. So, but we are actively, between DPW and myself, um, trying to get some formal submission of their uh, request to, to DPW for a road opening permit for this project. I think eventually would come to the Board of Selectmen, I would, I would I believe. Think the interesting thing about this project, um, besides all the technical stuff, which obviously is gonna be a challenge, I know you'll, you'll solve. This project truly is going to enhance all of Hopkinton because the, the four corners of Hopkinton's downtown truly are, you know, the crossroads of the community. I mean, those, th those corners, everyone's going to go through this process, whether you come right into downtown or not, because if you're coming from my side of town to take your kids to school on a Monday morning at 7 a.m. in the summer of that year or, or the spring of that year, it's going to be a tough little commute. I mean, we're all going to go through this because it's going to impact everybody Certainly everybody living right in the downtown area, but everybody that moves around Hopkinton will be impacted too. So we got to all pull together on this one. It, it shouldn't be too long of a project uh, compared to some others that have been done in Metro West. Uh, but on the other side of it, it's going to be really nice. You know, so this, this will be a challenge for all of us, <coughs> certainly for the people living downtown, but for everybody that commutes around town too. I think we just got to all kind of grin and bear it together. But it's going to be cool when it's done. Are we going to do something to the chair? Are we going to do something like this at town meeting? Or are we just going to, or not? We're done with town meeting. Okay. There's yeah. nothing on the warrant. No, 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 no. I just meant just to, because in case people, are, you know, that's where we get a lot of, we get a lot of press at town meeting. Maybe you know, people would know about it because again, we're talking about the, the coordination of, that you mentioned earlier, parking and everything else. So I think this will come back before us several times. <coughs> yeah. 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 We'll cover it, but. As far as town meeting votes go, I don't think we have to go back to town meeting. No, no, I didn't mean for a vote, but I just meant informational. for informational. Informational. We, we could do an informational thing, sure. <coughs> but we don't need any more article debates. Oh, no, <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, but we probably have board. We can put up boards in the in the lobby. Yeah, and, yeah. sure. And I'll hand out. I think Dave, you love speaking at town meeting. I think yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we do it on a Sunday. <laughs> All right. Good. Okay. So, any questions on the part of the board? Anybody? Oh, looks good. So, yeah, can we just get a two-second overview of just the aesthetics, um, like how it's going to look when we're done here, based on the seventy-five percent? Yeah, the, the 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 plans that I have up are um, work in progress. VHB was able to, to put these together. Um, it, it it's kind of to show, like you said, the aesthetics or what that project's going to look like. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the um, what's up on the plan there? The brick red is a texturized <coughs> crosswalk. That's uh, patterned with a uh, brick stamp. It's a synthetic pavement that's uh, durable uh, and they mill out the pavement and they pour that in and stamp that in. Um, and on the, it, and that'll, uh, these are things we'll work out over the next design, but it's just the, the shade and the color of the, of the brick, uh, that, that color will be worked out. Um, and in, the contractor will have to provide a mock-up example for the town to approve before he actually does any of that work. That's that stamp concrete, same that's as the common? Stamp. Yep. Yeah. And the, uh, the major changes at this intersection, uh, th this, this turning radius is, is being widened out a bit so trucks can make this corner. Mm -hmm. uh, we're adding a left turn lane here mm -hmm. so that, you know, there's a lot of backup caused by the one lane now. Um, and, and we're trying to, we'll continue to, to look at ways to improve the, 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 this intersection. We have this, you know, no parking box, box out here. Um, yeah, but if you painted look right, in that box, 
Maybe people would actually look to their right and let folks come out of that street. Right. That would enhance uh, rear end collisions moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever, we'd still get more people out of there. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's true. That's, I, I, if that, safe. Yeah, that's, that's something I think we should do. Uh, John, if, if I make to the chair. Yeah, are there signs that say, don't block the box? You know what I mean? Like they have in New York? Because you know, it, it happens to me a lot. You know, on Lumber Street, we have a, a box, and we have one right there. Uh, on Main Street, right near um, the... Uh, Passage. Yeah, uh, right. And people just don't know it, and they just stop and block an intersection. It's like, open your eyes. So, and again, as the project progresses towards... Uh, 85, 135, there's sidewalks on both sides of the street, all the way from uh, Ash Street to Wood Street. Um, we're, we're trying to um, reduce the number of, of pedestrian cross crosswalks um, that are out there now, but with, with the sidewalks on both sides, it helps us, allows us to do that. Is that the bike lane of the red line there? Green. Uh, this line? Uh, on the south side, parallel with the road there. It's a, it's yes, a there's, a, there's a cement concrete stamped buffer between the bike lane and the edge of the roadway on the south side of the road. Right. And how, how raised up is the <coughs> bike lane? There's a four inch curb reveal at the bike lane and then an additional two inch curb reveal between the bike lane and the sidewalk. Okay. Uh, and, and where you show all these trees, I assume these are new trees. Yes. All the, all the trees, the colored up trees on the plants are, are new proposed trees. There's one thing I'm never convinced happens in developments in general is they show all these trees on plants. Yeah. And then you go through the neighborhood and you're like, we're all trees. Yeah. Yeah. It's all <laughs> I don't think the trees ever quite make it. We really need trees along here. We want a tree lined street street. We, we've done our best to locate them where we can. Um, yeah, there yeah. are some limitations because sure. of all of the underground utilities yeah. and then in the first half of the project, the overhead wires um, do limit the placement in some locations and, and making sure that we maintain uh, an accessible route for the entire length. But we are doing our best to, to put back several trees, particularly in the downtown area as you head further to the east. I, I, I believe there's several more trees in there. Um, can show you. Yep. Yeah, the, at the intersection, sort of. that's nice there on the right side. Yeah. Oh, so the gas station is now. That'll be yep. good. So when we come, we come through, obviously, we'll, we have this newer green space in this area to the uh, west of, on Grove Street. Um, and then coming up, the right of way widens up as you go through it to by May by Walcott and, and over towards the common, so we'll be able to, to utilize um, until you get to the common where we can we can have a lot more trees and there's some additional green space that we can do. Are you putting trees on the Doughboy Triangle? There are some proposed. However, we are planning on meeting with the historic commission to get their input. The so it's it, this is a work in progress. Oh, okay. Good luck. They, they, they got this. Just put a big X to those trees. Right? Yeah. Well, I love I love trees, but the point, you know, They'd it's never had trees on it because it's sort of a, a visual thing, and you don't put a tree in front. So they'll talk to you. I was just. How about the three, Claire, right on the corner of the common there, and that new bump out? I don't care what you do over there. Just don't block the doughboy. Okay. Um, I, I would like to point out that those three trees are going in an area that's currently paved, so the the view of the, the statue should not be. And the trees grow. Uh, should not be. We should debate that historically. We'll debate that somewhere else, yeah. but we'll yeah. 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 again, the, these are it's not these aren't final. I mean, this is this is where we work out the details between here and the next design submission. Mm -hmm. Look great. Good job. Any other questions? And where does it end on the right, Dave? Is that it right there? We yeah, it goes, it goes down a, a, a bit beyond Ash Street, um, mostly for the uh, undergrounding. Uh, we, we have to stagger where it goes from uh, overhead undergrounding. You have, to, you have to go a couple poles since we're putting so many different utilities underground. Poles kind of over here? But poles will be There's in this area probably. There's poles there now. It's just that all the underground utilities can't go up one pole because there's too many got utilities. So you got to bring up some on the other and go down on the next pole and bring them up on the next. But those poles are to the east of the common. Correct. Correct. Yes. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And if I may, through the chair, there's only one other thing. The BAA might be asking us that they might want to put some electronics underneath the road right there for the. Uh, yeah, yeah, one members. of the groups we, we are going to meet was the, was the right. BAA. They, they had some preliminary discussions about mm -hmm. doing other things at the start. Yeah, there was, yeah, and, yeah, and so well, stanchions on the side for. for, for yeah. yeah. And where do the poles disappear near the police or fire? You see those? They, they start after the after the fire station, but it, again, it goes two or three poles. Um, I believe it's oh. by Summer Street. Right. Uh, so when we do banners, what do we hang the banners on now? The poles or the street oh, lights? Oh, right. Well, we'll, have, we'll, have, to so, have, we'll so have to have provisions for those so on we, the light poles. We have, right now we have provisions to show ornamental poles um, in two locations, so one pole on each side for ha hanging banners. And we'll work with the committees to place them appropriately. Right now we have them, I think... Um, one at the start and then one on the approach to the start between Cedar, Cedar and, Street and the start. And Hayton Row, somewhere in there. So a okay. pair. Okay. Somewhere where we hang, they hang the banners. So the, the, the intent is that the poles are going to, the ornamental features of those poles will match the ornamental features of the street lighting. And that's another thing that we'll go and talk to the Historic Commission about, about the types of lighting, which is supposed to match. Uh, right now we have features matching the common, uh, the, the, the foundations and the, and the fluted poles and that sort of thing in there. So they're going to be dedicated poles just for the banners? They're not going to have a street light or anything on them? They're just going to be a pole? So that's it, so. there's a couple things. Yes, that's kind of where we're heading right now, uh -huh. um, which means you'll have a pole with nothing on it right. um, when there's no banner. Sure. Um, but there are other features that we need, can talk about on these poles about having banner brackets or other things that you can put on them. Um, also, how tall we want this pole to be so that we know what the sag might be for some um, banner that needs to be hung so that you have the appropriate clearance. Um, and receptacles for electrical. And receptacles for electrical and things like that. So those are all little features that will be kind of trying to iron out over the next, before the next submission. But your street lights wouldn't accommodate the, the, the banner? It has to be a... I think the street lights, usually they're, I think they're about 25 feet tall, so we can look and see if they might be able to accommodate it, but sometimes you can extend a pole up higher and then put a banner over the top. Um, it's just gonna, it's gonna depend on, um, you know, the type of banner, how high we need to go. So we, we could look at an option that has a taller pole that has the light the lights on it and it it just ends up adding more weight to the that particular I, i'm just i'm glad that you're thinking about banners because yeah. we do use the banner thing and, yeah. and the light poles will have banner arms on them for smaller flags mm -hmm. the, 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 the stanchions <coughs> sure right. the stanchions so, so back to the poles at the fire station right. where are they disappearing uh, here's the fire department um obviously where it says fire department the h cam i call it the h cam building but right across from there the poles will start going down um, so the and, poles and come down basically so or around, around summer, summer street. around Summer Street. Okay. It'll start going underground. Mm -hmm. Around okay. Summer Street to start going in the ground? Yes. Got it. Yeah. And then the oh, light poles me. themselves, we're not going to put light poles every five feet like we've seen in some Metro West communities, right? We're doing just a bare minimum light pole. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the direction we've given PHP because they, they, they've asked, you know, it, less light is better is what I said, but it's not really, really like darkness. Right. To try to spread the lights out as much as possible while maintaining safety for the throughout the And corner. then all the cobra heads are going away. Between yes. Between summer and the common. Yes. 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 What, what, what's going to be there? We still have to go through the historic district to get there and point. There's, there's all sorts of. The, the standard light. There's, there's all sorts yeah. of different. Uh, I don't speak the lingo. I'm yeah. a nurse. Different, <laughs> different lamps. It's, it's, it's something. It's just an arm of a light bracket that sometimes is mounted just to the on wood post, post, or it could be just on an aluminum pole. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Are we good? I'm good. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you, you for thank coming you. and giving thank us you. all this update. We really appreciate it. Great. Thank you for having us. It's going to be great. Yeah, it will. Awesome. Yeah. We'll get there. It'll look really nice. It's going to make Hopkinton great again. Dave, I put a few dates in my cell phone. I'm going to get little reminders on it. <laughs> And I got John Westling's name next to it. So. <laughs> John, you weren't here at the beginning of the meeting. Um, your name was brought up. A little something I'd like to follow up on. Um, Sunday, 
at the Fleet Center. I didn't know exactly which squad you were rooting for. Yeah, I, I read uh, it on you. You said you were rooting for Wachusett, John. If you noticed, I was wearing green, so oh. I support yeah, you. That's great. Uh -huh. Happy St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> that, you should run for office. That was a political answer. <laughs> Okay. Uh, politician. I'm not a politician. <laughs> I'll tell I play you one, one thing. TV. As much as you just like that orange, it was the only way I could find our side. Because they were green and white as well. well it's like I was really green for the orange. Fine, just walking around <laughs> <laughs> looking for it. Okay. The H, I, I went doing by the great H. work now, Warren. He always goes them. on the yeah, side with the penalty down. box. That's right. right. That's it's right. It so feels most at home. <laughs> That's right. Good job. <laughs> Stay okay, off. budget update. We're only half an hour off, but that was totally worthwhile. Um, FY20 budget update. The town manager will update the board of selectmen relative to the board's March 5th vote that the overall FY20 budget tax impact net of new growth be reduced to 2.5%. The board of selectmen will also consider placing a ballot question at the next election which would reduce the levy limit on a recurring basis for the start of the fiscal year 2021 town budget process and beyond. So, and I see that our finance team put together a very helpful overview of what an underride uh, would or wouldn't do and its pros and cons. Um, thank you very much really helpful. So, Kamala, would you like to start this off for us? Yes, um, through the chair. On March 5th, I presented you with a revised budget incorporating several changes uh, that had been discussed during your budget hearings and several revisions to the budgetary projections based on newly available information. Um, the March 5th revision called for $81 million in spending, with $4 million to be raised from new property tax sources, $2 million from new growth, and $2 million from increased tax levy on existing taxpayers. Uh, in other words, they suggested 2.92% rise on existing taxpayers. And at the March 5th meeting, the board directed me to revisit the budget again with the goal of reducing the increased tax levy on existing taxpayers down to 2.5%. I'm here tonight with an update for the board, working collaboratively with our colleagues from the school department. We have a tentative understanding as to how we can get to the 2.5%. Whilst I may not be able at this point to share the precise details with the board as to how we get there um, to allow our colleagues on the school department to discuss and review this preliminary understanding with the school committee, I can confidently say, yes, we will make it down to 2.5%. Assuming that these revisions that we're discussing with our colleagues get us down to 2.5%. It's important to highlight the following, which might be uh, significant in your discussions of the question pertaining to an underwrite. If the revisions that we're discussing go forward, uh, they would result in an unused tax levy of $1.18 million specifically 1,180,568, with a gross tax impact of 5.43%, comprised of new growth, and 2.5%, as I've said multiple times in the last two minutes, 
2.5% in increased tax levy on existing taxpayers. So again, we heard you loud and clear on March 5th. We have worked diligently with our colleagues from the school department to get down to uh, a tax impact of 2.5% net of new growth. I believe we have a plan that pending confirmation by the school committee will help move forward the discussion. Okay. Mr. Hur? So I uh, was not here on March 5th. Um, I had some business to attend to and was out of town. Uh, I did watch the uh, meeting on the following Sunday evening on HCAM. Um, so we are watched <laughs> on occasion. <laughs> Uh, and I was very pleased uh, with the budget discussion that took place, and I was very pleased, although they cut it off right at the good part where you're about to um, take the vote or something like that. I, that that's when they went to uh, Veterans Remember. <laughs> but I got the gist of it. And the explanation that the financial team gave that evening was really clear, really concise, and I think very helpful to the residents. So I've heard a couple people comment that they got it that evening, having watched, uh, and I watched it myself. And I thought it was a really good message. So thank you for doing that. I thought it was a job well done. Um, and I was pleased that, uh, you know, you're coming back. And, and now I'm pleased that you're coming back tonight, Mr. Kamalo, and you're getting that 2.5 number. I understand that these things need to be massaged, so we don't have to get into the detail of that. We'll let you handle it. At least I would. Um, but I thought uh, you guys did a great job on the 5th, and it sounds like we're on the right path here to get this done. Thank you. Um, I just have one, just want to make sure that we're not impacting public safety or cutting, cutting out the, uh, gutting the sidewalks like we did last year, making sure that, uh, you know, because we, we, I don't want to just kick the can down the road by, by trying to hit the 2.5%. Uh, the it, it, it's laudable. But I just want to make sure that we're not uh, kicking the can down the road when it comes to you know, sidewalks and some of these other things that we did last year. In fact, through the chair, if I may, I think throughout the proposed FY20 budget discussions, the board has expressed uh, support to the proposed expenditures uh, and encouraged us to really look at the, the sources side of the proposed budget um, to help address the issues that you've identified. Uh, and, and we are continuing along those lines, namely finding solutions by addressing the sources. We've identified opportunities in, with regard to how we are utilizing free cash, uh, we have also identified opportunities for funding some of the capital projects that we originally funded through free cash through other means. I can at least perhaps without getting into details uh, express our continued support for public safety. In fact, we may be coming back to the board with an amendment with regard to the number of firefighters that we may be asking town meeting to authorize, driven largely by the grant opportunities that we're now pursuing. In other words, we've identified opportunities to utilize a grant process that would allow us to request four firefighters instead of three. Again, I don't have the details yet, I'm um, just giving you a heads up that we continue to support public safety. We continue to address the question regarding sources. We're working diligently to find other ways of mitigating the tax impact on town residents. Very good. Thank you. I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. To the chair. I just want to say thank you for going through this extra effort. and. Uh, I think it must have been incredibly frustrating to go through the whole budget process and only to be told to <laughs> cut it back a bit. Um, I'm very impressed with what you've been able to accomplish. 
Uh, one thing that I just want to ensure is that I, you'd mentioned that you'd met with the school committee. I just want to make sure that we're not going to be diminishing any services from our public schools. I think that's uh, one of the pride and joy that we have here by reducing the, uh, by going, going back down to 2.5. That point is well taken through the chair. I can share again without getting into details that throughout this process we have actually found other ways of funding a school project that, at least two school projects that we were not able to fund previously. So we're continuing to look for opportunities to enhance service provision. Excellent, excellent, thank you. So Madam Chair, and with, and with this, March towards 2.5 for the existing tax base and plus new growth, which has been great. Um, and something that we have to consider as we consider other articles that may come before town meeting. Um, you're also talking about the underwrite, an opportunity for another underwrite. Is that correct? On March 5th, the board asked the town manager to prepare a contextual explanation of how the board could evaluate the opportunity for an underwrite. Yeah, okay. So had you, did you guys go, I did, that part must have got cut off, that must have been after the budget piece. Um, did you guys get too far, get far into that or no? There was not too much discussion about it. Mr. Tedstone proposed it, um, discussed it a little bit, but then decided that the best approach was to ask the town manager with the finance team to do an impartial analysis and give us the pros and cons, which, which is, is what here. we have now. Uh, it was getting very late, and we felt it was the Got best it. way to ask the finance team to analyze it. So you didn't miss much on that. Got it. So with, with that background, and I appreciate that, um, I have this in front of me that I think all our colleagues have in front of us, um, which is the amount of an underride that could be a possibility um, based on the unused tax levy and what that would do, you know, kind of in years out a little bit. Um, but I guess, I guess uh, I'm glad Mr. Tedstone raised the concept of the underride. From, from my perspective, having been through these uh, really lean years, uh, years back on the board when we only taxed 1%, 1.5%, which created this, and then having a couple of underrides already under our belt and watched how those underrides, while they were initially somewhat confusing to some of us, uh, myself included, uh, passing of the underrides, we learned, did not you know, end Hopkinton as we know it. Uh, Hopkinton has gone on and Hopkinton is doing great. And economically, financially, uh, we're doing very well. We're a very strong community. We've got great metrics. We've got a great bond rating, et cetera, et cetera. The underbride, to some extent, in my mind, has kind of run its course. And I think, again, I'm glad Mr. Tedstone brought it up, because I think it's time that maybe we put the concept of the underbride to rest in Hopkinton. It creates sort of a, or it, it, it seems to be creating now more of a, um, a false uh, cushion that while it's a reserve and it's still in the taxpayer's pockets, if we do the underbride, it stays in the taxpayers' pockets, and the reserve piece goes away. And Mr. Kamala wants if to I get may. in on the act. Go right ahead. Yeah, if I may, I, I think you're referring to the excess levy. I'm no, referring to the to excess the levy, and that's exactly. why I'm talking exactly. about yeah. the underwrite. Yes, okay. I appreciate. Yes, okay. sorry for the confusion. Um, so, I don't know about the timing of this year and the underwrite, uh, Mr. Ted Stone, but. And I see in the notes here this evening or the comments something about an FY21 uh, uh, um, implementation or something like that, or maybe I read something incorrectly. In, in fact, if I may, through the chair, we included, we have shared with, board, with the board two documents regarding the underwrite. Uh, there is a document that is included in your meeting packet. Mm -hmm that covers the, the background, uh, the history of the underwrite in town, and a presentation of what we believe is an impartial uh, explanation of the pros and the con. Oh. We also included, I think this, which is what we shared with you tonight, uh, an illustration of 
the past two underwrites, 2015 and 2018, and then three options that the board may consider tonight if, you are, if the board is so inclined to move forward with an underwrite. And the illustration identifies the underwrite amount, the unused tax levy before at the time the underwrite was considered in 2015 and 2018. That number presented also as a percentage, and we thought it was also important to depict the tax impact net of new growth in the year of the underwrite. Mm. So uh, with that, and, and fairly consistent, you know, at least in terms of the tax impact net of new growth with those underwrite years, um, why wouldn't we do, in a, well, okay, from one member's perspective, kind of thinking it's time to put the underrides to bed and sort of take it off the table by pass, put the excess levy to bed, rather, I'm sorry, by passing an underride. Um, why would, I, I, if we're gonna do it, an underwrite, I think we do it all. Like, I think we do 1,180,000, me, Mr. Non Details, $1,180,568 as the underwrite. And there, and, and, and then going forward, we're back to sort of square one on par with Massachusetts communities across the state where it's prop two and a half. And in an unfortunate, if it, and God forbid it were to happen, we needed to raise more, then we'd have to talk about an override but then the residents would have a chance to weigh in on that in very great detail at town meeting and at the ballot. Um, with this excess levy kind of hanging out there, it's been great and it's really helped us do some things here in Hopkinton the last several years, but we've also done the two underrides and we've gone on and we're all good. So I would advocate that we see if we can through town council do an underride on the ballot this year and I would advocate that it be the full amount and we put the underride to rest until such time as the next recession, God forbid, hits, and we have to look at taxes again. If I may, to the chair, you know, I, I, I agree that it just, it, it, it gives the transparency, you know, when, when we look at the budget and we were able to um, uh, tax up to 2.92% this year, and um, we didn't have to ask the uh, taxpayers for that uh, a little less than half a percent. Uh, next year or the year, subsequent years, if that happens, we we're at town meeting and say, look, we can get two and a half percent, but we need um, your approval for this 0.42 percent. You know, not to pick on projects or something, but then we just you know, and, and it just gives a, a level of transparency. <coughs> it makes it a heck of a lot tougher for for uh, uh, town hall personnel and, and everybody else and all the departments that they have to pull in and, and the only th the other thing I'm worried about is is our bond rating and some of that stuff because they do like to know that you have uh, um, <coughs> money in the bank so to speak that's I think that's why in 2018 and 15 we left a little bit just to, just so that uh, there was some uh, town hall had some walking around money so to speak the problem with leaving a little bit, though, is then at, you know, the time value of money kicks in, and that 200 grand, if we leave it on the table, becomes 600 grand in a few short years, and all of a sudden we've got this big excess levy again, and then we have this propensity to budget to the excess levy amount instead of budgeting the two and a half. Mm -hmm. So that's why, if, if you wipe it completely clean, it's you know zero percent of zero or three percent of zero is still zero. If you leave 100 grand in there, you know, 3% over a five year period, it's gonna be a lot more than 100 grand. So um, my sense is that it's time for the underride to be put to bed or the excess levy to be put to bed. And if we're really gonna do that, we have to do it the exact dollar and not leave anything on the table because that's just gonna grow again and we're gonna have the same conversation or you guys are gonna have the same conversation three or four years from now um, and it impacts Lots of different things, including sort of how people view the pot of money available and so on, you know, in negotiations and things like that. Well, you know, the excess levy doesn't come out of the taxpayer's pockets unless we take it out of the taxpayer's pocket. 
And the reason that we have consistently built up the excess levy is because we've done a very good job, I think, of trying to be responsive and responsible and not taking it out of the taxpayers. It's not a threat to anybody unless you have boards that are profligate spenders and are not going after that levy. And we've demonstrated going all the way back, here's 2015 and beyond, that we haven't, we haven't done that. Um, Mr. O'Leary put forth a very good analysis here, listing the pros and the cons. And some of the cons speak to our financial strength and our bond rating and how um, having that cushion, especially in things like the fact that our stabilization fund isn't where we need to be, or if some other expense came up that we really did need the excess money, um, or for instance, looking at the kind of growth in our school, school population, some of the building projects we're going to have to be taking on. There might be some cases coming down the road where we would need to have that excess cushion, and understandably, um, you know, you have to be uh, responsive to your taxpayers, but there was a case to be made for a financial strength of the organization. I also, I'm new to this. I take, give some value to the fact that, as I said, I bunched some of these workshops and they looked at me like I had three heads from another planet when I said that we had done underreds. Nobody had ever heard us, basically. Um, in Mr. O'Leary's analysis, he talked about how the 351 cities and towns in the Commonwealth, only a handful have ever done underrides, and I think Hopkinton and two other communities are the only ones that have ever done more than one. Um, you know, does that say something about wisdom? It, it sounds great, oh, let's just wipe it clean, but does that say something about wisdom in, in fiduciary responsibility if, you know, we, we are going that far outside the mainstream. I also find it interesting that when we asked the financial team to do this analysis, and they gave us three different options to show the, show the different effects, starting with removing 250,000, then 500,000, then a million, not a single one of these actually toyed with doing the entire thing. I, I'd be interested to hear from our financial team um, what their thoughts are. Nobody even looked at wiping the whole thing clean. Why is that? Um, do we feel that really is bridge too far? It's a risk? I mean, we're clearly way outside the mainstream. So prior to 2000 and, uh, when was the first year 15. we did the 15. 15. 15, where it was 12, 15. Uh, well, actually prior to 2008 or nine, when we first didn't tax up to the full two and a half, and for the 300 or approximately 300 years prior to that, there was no underrides in Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. So Hopkinton can live without an excess levy. Mm -hmm. We've proven that for 300 years, right? And we can continue at 2.5% to run a very effective government. Maybe some years we can run it under 25 depending on the economy. Um, so we can live without an excess levy sitting out there. We have done it for 300 years. We had to do it here with underrides and excess levy over the last 10 years following the Great Recession, or in the middle of the Great Recession, we acted appropriately, I think, and then we created excess levy and then we addressed it through the two underrides. The other point made was the cushion. If we need to build a new school, we're doing a debt exclusion, mm -hmm. which is outside the operating budget, which is above the two and a half, I get it, but that's for a project, and the voters will decide if they want to build a new school or not, or add on to Elmwood School, whatever it is we're going to do. Um, so there's ways to access additional funds from taxpayers when we have a situation arise that um, the, uh, the excess levy doesn't have to be the way to pay for it, and uh, a debt exclusion can be the way to pay for it, especially for big projects. In addition to that, we have the stabilization fund, which will be about $4 million, give or take, is my understanding, come the end of this year, maybe it's $3.75 million. Uh, that's a lot of cash sitting there for emergencies, too. So I understand the metrics that the MMA puts out there and the bonding companies put out there. They're all in the business of creating those metrics to generate revenue for their organizations. That's what they do. So it's like going to the dentist who says you should be flossing two times a day. Well, no one does that, but that's what they do because they're in the dental business, right? Um, I, I just feel very strongly that 
Hopkinton is an affluent community with a huge tax base. I think it was a $4 billion property tax valuation or something along those lines. Uh, and that's not going to go away. And so the excess levy, if it does go away, isn't going to impact the, uh, us a whole heck of a lot. It may create a few more debates along the way, but those are healthy. But if I may do the chair, well, actually, part of, part of uh, our being able to stay uh, under that two and a half was we, we creatively um, finance the projects, as you said, outside the levy limit. And we ask the, we ask the voters um, independently on each one of those. But one of the things that worries me is that uh, on this year's uh, warrant are, the, are a couple uh, <coughs> warrant articles about limiting growth in the town. And, and um, that's one of the things that, that we uh, live on is growth to, to manage uh, some of our uh, um, contra contractual obligations and such. And if, and if we limit some of this growth and, and uh, can't meet our contractual obligations, then we absolutely will have to have uh, overrides. So, so, so think of this, John. When the, when the underwrite is on the ballot, so I was on the ballot one year in local election, and the underride was on the ballot the same year. The underride beat me by a lot of votes. The underride always wins the votes, right? Gets the most votes. The town of Hopkinton loves the idea of limiting the tax revenues coming into the community. And, uh, and the underride wins the votes every time. If we put the, no disrespect, if we put the underride on the ballot this year, the underride will get more votes than anybody else. Through the chair. And I don't know the numbers on that, but I'll bet you it's in the 70 or 80 percent of them. Area. Although, I would posit that there may be some people that see the underwrite and think, oh, it's going to lower my taxes. It doesn't. It doesn't take anything off your tax bill. We have a consistent track record of not taking that levy, um, you know, unless the, the way the Board of Selectmen operates suddenly changes radically. I mean, I, I think, you know, I think the voters should be able to trust that the excess levy isn't going to do anything to you unless we go take it. I have seen huge swings in the Board of Selectmen in the 10 years I've been here. Huge swings in terms of tax thinking and other policy approaches. I just wonder how that looks to the bond rating agencies when you have no excess levy. We didn't have any excess levy for 300 years. Yeah. And most communities in, Hopkins, or in Massachusetts have no excess levy. It doesn't impact the bond ratings at all. It's nice to have. And it gets us from AAA to AAA plus or whatever it is we're at these days maybe. But as long as we have a healthy stabilization and a healthy tax base and a healthy property valuation process, I don't think it'll be a real big problem. Through the chair. Um, I don't disagree with anything anyone is saying here. Where I kind of fall on this is uh, I'm, I'm worried about our bond rating and our fiscal health from these agencies. And I understand what you're saying, Mr. Herr, that you know, they're in, that's their business. Um, but I don't see why we'd want to eliminate the excess levy if it's, if it's going to have an adverse impact on us. And I think as a board, by fiscal discipline, we just, we just went through a process of going from 2.92 back down to 2.5 with, with strong suggestions from the board that we don't want to tap the excess levy. And I think that's kind of the key here. It's like, we don't want to tap it. Obviously, it's easier not to tap it if you don't have it. <laughs> but but uh, if, if there's an adverse effect on our bond rating, um, I, I think it could be dangerous. What, a chief financial officer wish to weigh in on this, or you want to stay out of it? Uh, in fact, if, if, if I may. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Sir? Sir? Yeah. yeah. Um, if, if I may. We've provided the board with information on the pros and the con. At this point, the, the, the the effects or the impacts that we identify on both sides apply regardless of the amount. I, I, just, I just wanted to make sure that the board really understands the pro and the cons. And by the end of the day, the amount of the underwrite 
or if it's an override, is a policy question. And that is the reason it falls on the boards uh, to make that decision. Um, but again, feel free to, to jump in. I was actually going to read the email that we received from, uh, uh, from, our, uh, from Unibank. Uh, we did ask them specifically the question regarding the impact of underrides or overrides on the town's bond rating. And they responded, as of now, Standard & Poor's has not really focused on underrides. But if the town keeps doing this, it will cause them some concern. Each time you do an underwrite, it decreases your unused levy capacity, which is viewed by Standard & Poor's as an additional reserve and limits your future flexibility. We did capture the meaning of this statement in our description of the pros and the cons. Also understand, at least my own interpretation of this email, is that we were offered an opinion. It is not necessarily a fact. Mm -hmm. So through the chair, so it's basically a line of credit, like everybody has a, a line of credit, and um, you just can write a check out without anybody knowing to some extent. And basically, what we're trying to say is we just want to get rid of our line of credit, and when we need to buy something, we have to ask a town meeting. So let's say there's 351 town council, city councils, and board of selectmen meeting tonight to talk about their budgets. Okay, because there's 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts. I'll bet you um, uh, a couple of beers at Cornell's, or at CJ's when he opens up, that there is an, another city or town in Massachusetts tonight talking about an underwrite. And yet Standard & Poor's offers all those people a bond rating. And a lot of them have a really good bond rating. And we had a really good bond rating before we ever had an, under, an excess levy. So I, I understand what they're saying, but I don't think that taking the excess levy off the table is going to negatively impact our finances in any way, shape, or form. It may create a little bit more work for our board and our colleagues at the school committee and our colleagues at Parks and Rec and everywhere else that have to work with our administration to make things happen on the budget cycle each year, but it's not going to negatively impact our financial strength, which is very, very strong. Uh, in any way, shape, or form. And I personally believe that whenever, po it's just a philosophy of mine that I've had for a long time, even though my political philosophies are evolving as I get older in life, as Mr. Tedstone would know, um, and Mr. Catino for that matter, um, I personally believe that whenever possible, you err on the side of keeping the taxpayers' money in their pockets. And when you do that, and you run a tight ship, as Mr. Kamal and his team do, everything is good. Okay. Mr. O'Leary, did you want to add something to this? Well, uh, Mr. Kamal made my first statement that, uh, okay. <laughs> which is great <laughs> that my, my boss made my first statement, that the pros and cons are out there and we had a clear record set. And I would say this is that rare case where a prudent and fiscally conservative person could vote for uh, the underride to emphasize cost control and to signal a desire to hold spending down and taxes down in 2021 and beyond. But a different prudent and fiscally conservative person could vote against the underride to preserve maximum flexibility. There, there's no radical answer to this question. All the outcomes are responsible, reasonable uh, approaches. So it really does come down to a policy question, as the town manager said. I would say the dominant objective of the person making the vote really would tip the scale. And if the decision maker's dominant objective is to set the stage for cost containment, and efficiency in the future, then the yes vote would be the reasonable vote. And if the decision maker's dominant objective is to preserve maximum flexibility, 
to respond to exigent circumstances in a timely manner, that a no vote is reasonable. I don't think there's a bad vote. I don't think there's a crazy vote. I don't think there's an irresponsible vote on this. It really goes to whether your dominant focus is on maintaining the organization's flexibility or on setting the tone for cost control in the future. I don't want to say either way, as has been pointed out, the town of Hopkinton is extraordinarily stable. With or without the underwrite, I would invest my family's own money in the town or in the town's bonds, and I would suggest to anybody else that is perfectly safe for, and reasonable to do that. Uh, so it really comes down to what your focus is as decision makers, whether you wish to preserve the board's flexibility or whether you wish to take an approach where there is more restriction for increased spending in the future. No wrong answer here, I don't think. Well, I, w I would have to say, uh, you know, based on the analysis you gave us, I'm a little, I'm surprised that now we're talking about eliminating entirely. I, I wasn't looking at an all or nothing kind of a proposal. Um, based on some of the pros and cons that you set out, um, I would be more comfortable kind of splitting the difference with something that allows us some financial cushion and based on what Unibank has, has written to us with a warning, which, uh, you know, that doesn't come out of nowhere. That comes from a broad body of experience. Um, I, I, I still maintain that the money is in the taxpayer's pocket all the time. It's only out of their taxpayer's pocket if we take it, um, just regardless of the size of the excess levy. Nothing comes out of the taxpayer's pocket and nothing reduces your taxes. It's all the same until we take it. And we have a solid track record of, I think, being very fiscally responsible in not taking it. And there's no reason. Boards change, certainly, but historically, going back many years, we have we have been responsible in not taking that. So um, that's where I stand. I, I would not be uncomfortable with some reduction, but the concept of wiping it out completely, I think, is a little too radical for my fiscal sense right now. I think having sat through um, the years when we weren't taxing to the max, the two and a half, and then the excess levy was created, and then the underrides, uh, and leaving some on the books, which I voted to do, to Mrs. Wright's point. I have voted in the past to leave some on the books. Um, my thinking has evolved, and I've watched sort of how the excess levy is viewed in the community and how uh, it impacts certain th things that go on as we manage the community, uh, that it's time that we do clear it. Uh, so, Madam Chair, I would make a motion that the Board of Selectmen approve uh, a, a ballot question as well as uh, an article for town meeting and clean my clean up my language mr. Kamal if I get something wrong here on the procedures uh, to uh, put it forth an underride uh, for the town of Hopkinton to consider in the amount of one million one hundred eighty thousand five hundred sixty eight dollars second mr. Kamal is that language reasonable procedurally for the underride process I believe so. I think it is. Yeah, I mean, it it's identifies, it ident your, your motion identifies setting a ballot question. It identifies including an article um, as well it, uh, as an amount of the override. Underride. Yes, of the underride, sorry. See, this is what happens <laughs> right there. <laughs> yeah. And I, I agree with the CFO and his point that ne neither vote is a bad vote. I agree with that because mm -hmm. I've done it both ways. Tonight I'm advocating that we clear it fully. I have advocated in the past to leave money there for that cushion. But I think we're, we, we, the, the recession is behind us now. The cushion is there in the valuations of the community. The cushion is there in stabilization. I was on this board when stabilization was under a million dollars. I was on this board when our stabilization account was about 700 grand, if I remember correctly. So it was very low, because we were taking money out of stabilization to balance the budget. To do we had those years, too. Don't get you know, so I've seen it from a lot of different angles. And my gut tells me and my analysis of the, of the, of the numbers and the process that we go through annually uh, that it's time to clear it fully. 
but I don't think there's a wrong vote here. I really don't. Right. No, you, I, you, you described it perfectly because I, 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 I was talking on both sides of my mouth for a little while there. Um, just, I, I love having a line of credit, but uh, never like to touch it. I still maintain we shouldn't touch it, but it's always good to have it. Okay, are there other, other uh, discussions? Okay, there is a motion on the table to place a question on the ballot for an underride, uh, which will completely eliminate our excess levy in the amount of $1,180,568. Madam Chair, before we vote, if I could please vote to your point there about the number. Is that the, so is this like a car loan? Like will that number change between now and the day of the town meeting? Or is that the number, <laughs> or is that the number for FY19 sitting close of the year? I was gonna turn around, I believe the answer is that is the number we would be going with and if the world changes, we will have to adjust. If we have revenue shortfalls, we'll have to adjust, we'll have to slow hiring, we'll have to defer purchases, just as we would with any other budget adjustment. But that's in the following fiscal year. I'm talking about for town meeting this year. If yeah, for, for town meeting, the answer is, as we know, some of our budget sources information is not final. So this number may change. Yeah, so I guess my only concern, I'd like to clear the underride this year at town meeting in the ballot. And the number is approximately one million one hundred eighty thousand dollars so why don't we leave it that in the motion mm -hmm. so that there's a little flexibility there because i do think this number can adjust a little bit mm -hmm. between now and, and may 20th whenever it is so should the motion just say to eliminate the excess levy in its in levy in its entirety and then we put the number in at town meeting when we know the number we need a specific number at the time of setting the ballot question okay so let's go with that number with the understanding it may have to be adjusted. So, by, so the motion is well, 1185 whatever, with the understanding that number may need to be adjusted depending on, you know, and changes in the various inputs between now and town meeting. And is that good, John, as far as the motion? I accept the uh, friendly amendment. Okay. Are we all set? All right, there's a motion on the table and it has been seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And opposed? No. No. Do we need a standing vote? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay, the motion passes by a vote of three to two. Okay. All right. All right, so that's the budget <coughs> update. Uh, 2019 annual town meeting. The Board of Selectmen will review the draft annual town meeting warrant and will take positions on annual town meeting warrant articles. Um, we went through most of these, didn't we? All I saw were Kennel by Law, which we did, Fruit Street, which we did. Oh, I guess we didn't do Chamberlain Street or municipal parking. Um, the board has until, I believe, April 5th uh, to sign the warrant. And also, um, the board has until perhaps 14 days before town meeting uh, to take positions uh, based on the motions. And so, tonight, what we wanted to do was to at least give you the full breadth and the full menu of the town meeting one. And as I recall, we didn't take positions the other night. We talked about them, but we didn't take, we weren't asked to take a position. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And so the board does not necessarily need to take positions tonight. That could happen at a future meeting. Okay. Yeah. But we wanted the board to understand the full menu okay. and the full scope of the warrant. This okay. is the whole warrant? This is everything? Correct. When do we um, put in the order and all that stuff and lock down? before the warrant is signed, at least for public purposes. Mm -hmm. However, the town moderator still can adjust the warrant.
depending on the town's <coughs> established practice. When should it be signed? April 23rd. Yes, April 23rd. Okay. And we have a meeting before that? Sixth. Uh, yeah. yeah. The and uh, probably the 20th. Ninth right? and the. Uh, oh, ninth? Ninth and 23rd? Ninth and uh, Nine and 23. Okay, great. So it's signed the 23rd. Oh, you're going to love that, that one. what you just said? You just said it's signed the 23rd. Correct. You have up till the 23rd to sign. Yes. Is, is that when you have to initial every single page? Yes, and the Madam chair, that's a fun is, job. is ready to do that. Yeah. You forget what your initials are at one point. <laughs> okay. So this evening, um, it was presented to us in our packet. Are we here to discuss anything or... Uh, Again, the idea was for the board to understand the full scope. If in your review of the warrant prior to tonight's meeting you picked up anything that you'd like to bring to our attention, now is the time to do so. Well, I did see one thing, which was the uh, article on a feasibility study for Center School did not have a sponsor. And I don't know, Mr. Kamala, what entities you were thinking would appro be appropriate. I was wondering if that should be sponsored by the Board of Selectmen. We're the ones that constituted and appointed the Center School Committee and received their report. Um, would we be appropriate, or, or did you have thoughts on the best sponsor? Yeah, there are two options. It could either be the Board of Selectmen or the Permanent Building Committee or a jointly sponsored article where both the Board of Selectmen and the Permanent Building Committee uh, okay. sponsor the entity. Well, are, did any of the members have any comments or questions or um, input based on the draft as it's been presented to us? So it, ap it appeared to me that a number of articles are now there as borrowings that had been on the page you go. Is that right? Wasn't it? Did we move some of the page you go things to borrowings, or am I not? Um, specifically, there's one article that we're currently discussing with our colleagues from the school side that may shift from pay as you go to a borrowing. Okay. Yes. So. All right. Well, do other members have anything they'd like to speak to regarding the warrant? Not at this time. Nope. I'm good. Good so far? Yeah. Okay. All right. Having said that, um, then the town manager's report. Item A is a notice of intent to sell 3 Oliver Lane. The board may exercise the right of first refusal for the affordable dwelling unit which owner wishes to sell. Uh, I see it's a four bedroom house with a, uh, at 192 to 70. And it was presented to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund on February 27th and a response from the town is due on March 28th. So has the Affordable Housing Trust Fund weighed in at all? What did they do with it? Nothing? They did not respond. So, so I understand what's going on here. It's an affordable unit, so it has to be sold as an affordable unit. So. I'm not quite, I, I don't, forgive me, I don't completely understand what we're doing here. Can't, it can't be sold in the open market. Are they asking the, the, the town and the affordable trust fund to buy it, or are they? So the deed writer provides that um, when something is, for, is the owner wants to sell, right. the state sets the price and gives the town the option of exercising a right of first refusal so that if the town wants to find a qualified buyer. Uh -huh. If the town passes, then it goes to the open market and works with the state and they find the qualified buyer. So either way, it remains affordable. Okay, so it stays affordable. The town doing it would be then we would draw, we would draw first on those who might be on our list in search of an affordable that are in town? In this case, uh, talking with the state, they believe that there'll be a lot of interest in this because it's a four bedroom, single family home, right. and they recommend having a lottery, that there will be a lot of interest. 
Okay, so. So how? Do, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. So how does this tie up the homeowner that's trying to sell the house? Does this does this delay the homeowner in selling this house? It all has to be accomplished within ninety days. So do we have uh, do, do we have maintain a listing of you know initially the whole affordable housing was going to be you know preference given to local residents firefighters teachers whatever that can't afford do we do we maintain a list within our town a waiting list we do have a list and we notify them whenever something is available so if we acted on this then we could add, we could turn it over to those people in that list and if it goes to the state it's wide open there's no priority they'll be notified either way and there is no there is no priority so that well, the state will set if if they can set a priority but there are no priorities like there used to be it's a in lottery. Areas, mm -hmm. right but if the if the town acted on it then could the town give priority to the people that no. we maintain on a list no we have to go by the state guidelines so, so what really would be the no. advantage to the town taking any action why would we want to i don't think there is an advantage unless we were set up and had a consultant ready to conduct a lottery which right. we're not okay it's a no-brainer so there's no there's no real advantage to us no reason we would take any action it, it's going to be the same either way okay through the chair I've, I've actually represented a number of folks um, buying properties such as this that are affordable um, I, I don't see any advantage for the town taking it um, there is a process there's a there's an agency who knows what they're doing and uh, it's certainly you know that they have the guidance to kind of take you through that whole process and uh, Whereas the town, if we were to do it, if we were to exercise a right of first refusal, um, I think we'd be leaning heavily on the on the state anyway, so to, mm -hmm. to how, to, how to proceed. So the way this is set up now, if we have Hopkinton families who qualify for affordable housing and they've been here forever, we have no method for giving them a first crack at a Hopkinton house under any way it's everything's wide open it could be someone from uh bridgewater has, and there's hopkinton residents that qualify that don't have any any leg up on staying in hopkinton through affordable housing there are some remaining uh preference pools that the state does have but it's not like it used to be because of discrimination discrimination laws can't do that so okay even though it's a positive discrimination, I guess it's both. <laughs> well, it's just unfortunate because yeah. that was part of the that Absolutely. was part of the thing with affordable housing is we had our own people right here that you know <clears throat> wanted to stay in town, yeah. and if they qualified, that it was you know we could help we could help keep Hopkinton residents in Hopkinton. So that's unfortunate. Okay. Well, in that case, um, does anyone want to make a motion to for the town to exercise its right of first refusal? Nope. No. No. Okay, I hear no motion. Do we need to make a motion not to exercise? Okay, then uh, let's just, so we have it down. I guess I will request a motion to not exercise the town's right of first refusal on 3 Oliver Lane. So moved. Second. All right, moved and seconded. All those in favor of not exercising the right of first refusal, please say aye. 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 And opposed, that is unanimous to not invoke the right of first refusal. Okay, item B is parcel U621-0 off Mechanic Street. Um, this is a request for an informal review and feedback relative to whether the town may be interested in acquiring the land if it becomes available. Information has been circulated to town departments and boards committees for review and comment. So, and there's a map. Looks like it abuts the Fruit Street property and Whitehall Brook. Yeah, so this is, if you take a right on, if you're heading towards Westboro, you take a right on Mechanic, which is Largers. A little, little Go back, uh, as you follow that, that road back, uh, that kind of goes through the middle of it. Uh, 495 breaks it up. Um, you see, uh, if you go about, I don't know, to the top right corner of that, 
Uh, right by 495, you see those greenhouses that you'd normally see uh, this time of year coming uh, southbound on 495. So I don't see, so, so on the, I don't know, I don't have a compass here. So on the left side, which I guess is the westerly side, um, it looks like the, the land is delineates at the brook. So there's not gonna be any access coming from the east. I mean, coming from the west towards the east. Um, it's, it's broken up by 495 and then everything else is kind of the larder property there. Um, and the green, if I'm not mistaken, the green land is the, uh, the shaded green is town owned land. So, and a little bit, um, a little bit to the east on the north end side of it, I believe are the wells in town. And I was reading the thing that uh, Nelson McIntyre wrote back in a million years ago about the, uh, you know, about the, um, this is uphill from the well, so, so when they created the Conservation Commission, it, it had something to do with not just protecting our, our not just protecting our, our uh, wetlands, but making sure that nothing encroaches on our wells. So I'm a, um, I'm a proponent of, uh, you know, if it does come up for sale to, to look into uh, having the town uh, look into the right of its first refusal option to buy. I would agree with you. The fact that it's right up along our Fruit Street property and it's the other side of the Whitehall Brook, which uh, that was uh, a cre critical water yep. resource and the importance of keeping that pure, its proximity to our wells. Um, if that were were or could be developed in some negative fashion and could impact Whitehall Brook. Um, I, I, I don't know all the details on this. I think it needs more investigation by uh, conservation or, or other bodies that are more qualified than I am to assess it, but just its proximity to Whitehall Brook and our Fruit Street land would, in my opinion, make it worth, certainly worth taking a closer look at this. Good. From a water like resources protection standpoint. I'd like to add that um, from my former life at the DEP uh, and water resources protection, that was actually one of the um, one of the goals, one of the, I wouldn't say a requirement, but one of the goals for municipalities is that if you have a town owned well, the town should strive to acquire ownership of the zone A of that, of that well. So basically, we're, if you're drawing from there, there's a, a circle around it that the town mm -hmm. should own so we could restrict development and prevent uh, contamination. Mm -hmm. So I, I would be in favor of uh, exploring this as well. I think it's um, good, okay. worthwhile. So motion? Tina, do you have any? Uh, no, no, I, I was just trying to see access. I, no, I've driven down there before. <laughs> To, to mechanics reach back to back yeah. road to drive, drive. You gotta have a truck <laughs> yeah. to drive down so it. You look at it, John. No, no, no. If, if you yeah. Yeah. Coming right up right, right behind the fire station. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I've driven down there before. So that's. So if that's the fire station right there, mm -hmm. that's the access to Larder's. This John Larder's house, and then the kids have the house there. Yeah. This is the the, the road back, and those are the the green temporary greenhouses that you see there off 495. So the brook, the wells, the town wells are right over there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. You know, it's a, definitely let's look into it. Well, it looks to me like we don't need a vote. They're just looking for uh, informal review and feedback. Correct. We are not asking for a formal vote. We, right. I think, we understand from the board's comments that we need to continue the informal conversations with other town entities. Right. At some point, we will formulate a formal response that will bring back to the board and forward then at that point forward it back to the property owner. Okay, well, clearly you've, there's been a positive response on the part of the board yep. to look into it further. Absolutely. So I think that's all we need, that's all we need to do right now on yeah. that. So, um, that's all that's here. Anything more, Mr. Kamal on Tom, any support that any surprises up your sleeve that's not on the... <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
Um, I sent an email to the board regarding an idea that has been put forth by Representative Dykema's office. There's an opportunity to expand the Green Communities Grant and her staff has contacted Town Hall to see if Hopkinton could be the venue for announcing this expansion. Does that need to be an action item right now or? Just wanted to get an indication from the board. I'm ready to respond. You may recall when the Green Communities Grant was actually announced for the first time, it was done here in Hopkinton in front of the police station in celebration of the solar panels and the other green initiatives that the town had already undertaken. Well, we do like renewable energy. I, I confess you sent it and I looked at it and then didn't look at it carefully. Um, so so is, is this just, because I, I confess I haven't read it, is this just a, a kind of an overall so, statement that we make? Does it carry any strings attached? Well, I, I think I believe it's, it's, if the community is so inclined and this is consistent with the town's mission and vision, this would be appropriate branding. Uh, secondly, it's also an opportunity for us to mm -hmm. celebrate with the rest of the Commonwealth the accomplishments that we have made relative to being a, green, a certified green community. And then thirdly, if the bill moves forward in terms of expanding the, emis the emissions component of the green community grant process, we will be applying for those grants. So, I, I, okay, so I think this is a win for the town. So there are opportunities attached, but there are not necessarily any new requirements imposed. Like if you if you sign on to the green community, then you suddenly have some way things you have to comply with or do with your buildings or or any obligations. No, it's on a stretch or, or something. I think that that's that's so what you're talking about. The you know, stretching stretch build requirements and all that kind of stuff. And in, in fact, at this point, there's no requirement on the town to do anything. They're simply announcing that the green mm -hmm. communities grant program is expanding. The only reason I ask is because, in all fairness, I, I looked at the email and then I didn't go back and read the whole thing. And I, I just, <coughs> if I'm voting for something, I want to know what I'm voting for, especially if there are any <coughs> things attached that could have ramifications to the town. Like suddenly you're required to do all kinds of things that maybe we don't want to do. So, in which case we might, but I want to know it first. So, but it's it's no strings attached as far as you see. No string attached. They're simply looking for a venue to announce this new grant program. I see. Okay. So do we need a vote on this? No vote. All I need is an indication from the board that this is an event worth holding here in the community. This is an event worth holding here in the community. Okay. <laughs> I agree. <coughs> I agree. All right. Bye. I like uh, flaunting our green credentials. Me too. As long as we don't aren't obligated to another solar farm somewhere that we don't want. <laughs> <laughs> we like solar and wind. Uh, we, we like do, to but sometimes, we like to minimize our, our sometimes carbon it footprint. comes with some ramifications. That is true. That is true. So we're, learning, chair, we're learning lessons. I have one, one more thing I just want to quickly bring up. It was an email that we got okay. um, from one of the uh, sergeants on the police department. On um, February 22nd, uh, there was a house in town that was bought by the Gary Sinise Foundation. Yes. And uh, he's an actor that buys homes through his foundation, fixes them up, and makes them into move-in condition for veterans. Mm -hmm. So uh, if anyone doesn't know who Gary Sinise is, he was uh, Lieutenant Dan. In Forrest Gump. Yeah. <laughs> and um, Captain in a, a, just a, a ton of, of other movies and TV shows. and. He's just, uh, he's magical for the, for the veterans and uh, the, the soldiers returning and, and it, it's just awesome to see Hopkinton on his roadmap that, it, that he picked up one of these houses and he's going to fix it up and make it uh, livable for, for, for some yeah. veterans. Yeah, so it's absolutely awesome. I would, I would love to, to um, I don't know, I don't imagine we can get him here to have a conversation with him, but we could certainly uh, get a correspondence out to him. Yeah. We'll send them out. No, Madam Chair, could we send out a little citation saying thank you very much, signed by us? We cook up something to say thank you. Do we, do we, do we go out citations for everything. To your community? We'll work with the chair. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. 
Let's see what we can do. Yep. See what we can do. It's a little stronger than a letter. Yeah. All right. Um, we were kind of at the end of liaison reports, uh, invites. Uh, Mr. Nasrul and I had not gotten to ours if we had anything. Do you have anything? I do not. Okay. I don't really, other than uh, as planning board liaison, an update that on Monday night, the 25th meeting, they will be continuing the rehearing of the TJA solar um, farm and also discussing their uh, town meeting articles and the citizen petitions. So uh, anyone's interested, it's worth, worth watching. Um, Nothing else right now. I have one more. I, I, oh. I, I attended along with uh, several hundred other uh, uh, people from um, from Metro. Hopkinton. You, you, yeah, you were there also for the uh, Metro uh, West the, Y. The, the Metro West Y and uh, great, well attended event. Uh, with the kickoff for the marathon and the other one was um, on Saturday. The um, the police took on a. Uh, a uh, all-star Special Olympics team at the uh, middle school at the Brown Gym. That was a lot of fun. Uh, the, 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 uh, uh, Madam Chairman and I uh, attended that. It was well attended. The food afterwards was great. Uh, you know, I, I really recommend it. It's it's a really uh, it's a it's a community getting together, and it's just <coughs> so much fun. everybody had a great time. But I don't know what's the matter with our police. I mean, they're just going oh, to have to do better. A hundred <laughs> to fifty was pathetic. So police, they have to practice a little bit more. You got to pull up your socks a little. Well, up. You know what? In the true liberal <laughs> sense, at least they came in second. At least they came in second. They <laughs> certainly gets did. Gets an okay. Award. Future board agenda items. Anybody? Nope. Okay. Parking. Then parking. Parking. Park. Park. <laughs> Shared parking, parking, parking would be even better. Uh, All right. I will awesome. entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. And a second. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank Isabel, you, thanks everybody. for watching.